again, this, <laughs> this title music is so good. the latest one, I think. You can't beat the whammy bar. Welcome. You've got dads. Oh yeah, I had a message from him I was reading. I'm gonna do something. He said he wanted to go to the gym. There's 30 more minutes left in this meat hell marathon. I'm outside right now. I'm warming up. Okay, okay. At least when I see a Betty gets away from the wolves in time to get her sort spread it, get her sort of prasada wrapped cheesecake out of the oven. Hmm. Try to drive in a way where you never have to use your brakes. Laserdisc is clearly a superior digital video format. What you do when you have to do will have to do when you don't have to will determine where at. The gym just installed this new virtual jogging treadmill, so we'll feel like we're running outdoors. You can see other runners on your screen, too. Let's try it out together. Other runners? Will I be able to keep up? Don't worry, we're here to cheer each other on. I'll be right there with you. Nice. Just get a rhythm going, keep your heart rate up, but don't overexert yourself. You'll do great. Okay. Run that dad. Okay, ha. Huh. Ba, 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 Okay, I think I have a rhythm going. Eggplant? <laughs> this is so cute. Trying to hit it at like a comfortable pace. Hey. Okay, now he likes that. Okay, gotta go a bit faster now. Okay. I think I got the hang of this. Ooh. I'm slapping this arrow key right now. Gotta keep up. Still jogging or are we running? This feels like a run. Oh. I'm running with my arms. Okay, it gets happy when we pass people, it seems like. Switching arms, ah! can get there. Ugh. Always running backward. Personal bet. <laughs> okay. Way to go. Sure. Moving pin. Oh. You've got dads. Okay, next up was Robert, right? Gun. <laughs> Italian neorealism. Okay, 
let's let's see what we can do with him. I was going over his information again. Just in case. You're young, you have your health. Now is the time to take risks. Pretty to fall every day. Robert was pretty nice, a little odd, but nice and ruggedly handsome. We should hang out. I type out a message to him on Dad Book. Hey, Robert, good seeing you again at the cookout. Want to grab a drink? I sit there for a couple seconds, hoping to message me back. Hey, it says to read my message. I anxiously wait for a response. Watch cat videos on the internet. I start down a rabbit hole of cat videos, and Robert quickly vanishes from my mind. I didn't realize how long I'd been doing this, but by the time I watch maybe my 30th cat video, Robert pops back into my head. I jump back over to Dad Book to see if he responded yet. Nothing. Well, I guess the guy's busy. Might as well make the best of my day. I get up, walk to the living room, then sit down and turn on the TV. Food. Oh, meat hell is on. You have 10 minutes to cook a five-course meal that must include these ingredients. Steak, lemon meringue pie, paper clips, and a hammer. If you are unable to finish cooking, or if any of these ingredients are absent from the dish, we will release the wolves. Oh my god. I'm not kidding. Please help us. I lose several hours to whatever the hell that was. Sighing, I get up and walk around the house. My stomach grumbles. Time for lunch, huh? Well, I guess it's time for old Chef Monroe to cook a gourmet delicacy. I walk over to the refrigerator and open the door. Sandwich, microwave, some eggs, mustard jar. Let's make something proper. I make a sandwich in its entirety while standing there. Who needs plates? The sandwich, a lost art. I admire my work for a second before I clumsily drop the entire thing on the floor. No! I look around and remember that Amanda's not home. This is still good. Five second roll, right? I reassemble my sandwich, peeling pickles off the floor and putting them back where they belong in my mouth. Wait, I'm a wreck. I finish my snack and walk around the house some more, bored. When is Amanda coming home? Oh, I just remembered something. When we were packing up the old house, we found an old basketball hoop that would hang off the door. It would really bring the living room together. I wonder where I put that. I spend a couple minutes poking around the new place until I find it. After installing it above one of the doors in the living room, I'm ready to dunk. Come on and slam. I take a leap from the free throw line and sprocket that sucker down the net. The crowd goes wild. And welcome to the jam. I pull up from pull up from the three-point line, breaking ankles and sinking a fade away. And I forgot the rest of the words to this song. No look behind the back. No look behind the back hook shot. Everyone's on their feet. Something something space jam. I barely managed to. I just managed to just barely defeat myself at horse before Amanda comes home and we cook dinner together. And we're proud of ourselves for not even coming down to burn, coming close to burning down the house. Afterward, Amanda and I dig into a carton of ice cream over an episode of Chopped Toddler Tournament. What you have in front of you is a molecularly deconstructed sweet potato with brown sugar, demi glace, with cream fraiche, of course. This is literally a jar of baby food. The toddler immediately bursts into tears. Are we bad people for watching this? Yes. After a few more episodes, Amanda goes to bed. I check my computer one last time. Still nothing from Robert. But it said he read my message. Is he ignoring me? Eventually, I climb into bed to get some rest, but I just can't stop wondering why Robert won't message me back. Managing debt is just part of being an adult. Date complete. <laughs> Respect, food channel, paranoia, whiskey, vandalism, white wine. What? A C. What? Welcome. Okay. You've got dads. Okay. Oh, wait. I have to... What is this? Brogan, listen. This is you from the past. What? Whoa, how'd this happen? Is this... Is this Dad Manda? I figure you're trying to reply to this because I know myself. This is an automated message from you earlier this morning when it was socially unacceptable to go out and buy ice cream. Forgot I did that. Forgot how I did that as well. The future is amazing. Listen, life is short and ice cream should always be acceptable, but unfortunately, this isn't the society we live in, and it's less the society we live in and more me projecting my own anxiety about being judged onto others, but you know what I mean. By the time you're reading this, it is a certain time of day in which nobody will bat an eye at you for going out and buying ice cream. You know what to do. Be good, me. Let's get some ice cream. If you're parking uphill, be sure to turn your tires toward the street. You know what? I've earned a treat. On the way home, I decided to stop off and grab some ice cream, which I fully plan to eat directly from the tub. 
I spend a lot of time trying to figure out just which type of ice cream I'd like to eat directly from the tub. Rocky Road? Pistachio? Oh, Amanda's probably going to want some too. Better get two tubs. She loves cookie dough ice cream, right? Hey, mister. I t turn around. Hey, mister. Okay, I turn around to see Ernest leaning up against the wall of the convenience store. Ernest? You're cool, right? I'm cool. I'm cool, but I don't see what that has to do with anything. Well, if you're cool, you'll help me out, right? Help you out? There's no fire involved, is there? Just clouds. So if I give you $20, will you buy me e-liquid? Ernest, what's e-liquid? It's like, uh, Gatorade, you know, electrolyte liquid. I'd get it myself, but I'm banned from here for trying to run a grift on the cashier. A classic fiddle game, you know the deal. Oh, if you're talking about the balanced electrolytes, then I got you, little buddy. And I didn't know you played the fiddle. Just ask the clerk for blue cran blue cran ras apple vortex. He'll know what it is. I think I have a tub of tub pistachio ice cream for myself and a tub of cookie dough for Amanda. I search around for some blue craze and void starer, but I can't seem to find any. I turn to the cashier. Say, where's your finest e liquid? Behind the counter. You got an ID? First of all, my daughter is older than you. Second of all, I'm flattered. Switch I switched shampoo recently. Is that taking some years off? Look, you need to be 21 to buy vape juice. Your hair doesn't look a day over 20. <laughs> Wait a minute. Are you just trying to butter me up to get me to get me to buy more ice cream? Because it's working. I glance outside and spot Ernest staring at me. Double wait a minute. So you're telling me that e-liquid is not a sports drink. It's for vaping. Ernest is watching us intently through the window. I better go give that kid a piece of my mind. I see. Okay, look, I'm gonna pretend you didn't try to trick me into buying you old Baphomet cough syrup and then go in. And then go inside here to purchase my ice cream. I won't tell dad if you... I won't tell dad if you... Pro tell your dad if you promise to scram. And stop babing. You'll get popcorn along. What if I give you $25? Go home, Ernest. As I'm walking back inside, Ernest calls after me. You can get popcorn along from microwave popcorn, you know. I no longer trust this child, but the mere notion strikes fear into my heart. I go back inside to complete my purchase with the good cashier. Thank you, kind sir, for your time and generous hair compliments. Got it, bub. I glance out the window while to Glendo. I glance out the window while to see Ernest still outside. Looks like he's still talking. Looks like he's talking to some other poor sap. I guess I should go outside and save this other guy some grief. Wait a second, that's definitely a cop. Oh boy. I grab my tubs of ice cream and bolt outside. Ernest is already face down on the hood of a squad car. Ernest, did you seriously just try to get a cop to buy you e-liquid? Do you know this kid? I'm friends with his dad. My daughter goes to the school. Uh, my daughter goes to school with him. I promise he's a good kid, even though my daughter would absolutely disagree with me. I'm this boy's father. I turn around and see Robert walking up the street toward the convenience store. Ernest, what are you doing? I want a lawyer. First of all, good first instinct. Remember that you're not required to answer any questions from a police officer without a lawyer present. You're this boy's father? Yes, sir. Ernest likes to lash out at me like this ever since the accident. Oh, so he's pretending to be his dad. Oh, um, I don't like talking about it. That's fine. Robert gets a wistful twinkle in his eye. It all started seven summers ago. My hair was long, and the new metal was still in style. Ernest and I were down to the Florida swampland, scavenging for... Sir, I can leave you to take it from here. Sounds good. Thanks, officer. Ernest, come along now. You'll be cleaning grout from the rain gutter for a week, thanks to this transgression. The officer gets in, police officer gets in his car and drives off. I'm stunned by how cool Robert was just there. Thanks. I want to say, Richard... Ouch. Don't mention a Hemingway. <laughs> Got in trouble plenty of times in my life just trying to do a good deed for the day. Will you buy me e-liquid if I give you $20? Child, I will end you. <laughs> hey, Brogan, will you walk Ernest home with me? Sure. I... I got some ice cream. Do you want to share it? Ernest runs ahead, presumably so he won't be seen with us, which is the thing I think kids do. Reminds me a lot of myself when I was his age. Well, maybe I wasn't as dumb. Seems like he tortures his dad. Seems like he tortures just about everybody. He even stole your wallet. What? No, we did I pat my back pocket. I pat the rest of my pockets. He stole my wallet. Why are you doing this to yourself? I... What? Robert points at my tubs of ice cream. One of them's for Amanda. I have no qualms with the quantity of ice cream you purchased. It's a perfectly respectable amount of ice cream. It's a quantity and quality I'm talking about. You work hard, Rogan. You're a good dad. Don't you think you deserve top shelf ice cream? But these were on sale. <laughs> if you're going to treat yourself, go big or go home. Real vanilla bean, real pistachio. You deserve it. I... He's right. We arrive at the cul-de-sac and Ernest runs into his home. That boy is the reason why we don't have prizes and cereal anymore. <laughs> Catch you around, Brogan. 
Robert tosses me my wallet. I catch it with a surprised mm -hmm. look on my face. I stole it back. Mm -hmm. Keep it in your front pocket or use a chain like back in your ska days. Smell you later. Uh, see you, Robert. I go back inside my home, ready to spend the rest of the night with two tubs of ice cream and also Amanda. Pay your bills early. Welcome. You've got dads. I guess that was his version of a date, huh? All right. Okay, true kind progress, taxidermy, cut in bosom. Mm -hmm. or Information superhighway. Always try your best at everything. This game is so sweet. Damien seems really interested. A little odd, but interesting. I think I should hang out with him to get him to know him a little better. I navigate to Damien's dad book page and type out a message. Hey, dude, you seem cool. We should hang out sometime. I sit there for a minute before I see Damien's typing. But then he keeps typing. <laughs> and typing. Man, is this guy writing a novel? I leave the computer to make some coffee. And he's still typing. I sip my coffee and the computer finally dings. Broken. I must confess my excitement to be receiving your kind letter, for as you see, I do find myself available to enjoy your company. I must ask for your forgiveness, however, as I believe our first meeting did not paint me in a gentlemanly manner, as an in as gentlemanly a manner as I would have liked. Well, there's more. I would be highly flattered to enjoy your companionship at my residence for an afternoon tea and a stroll around my garden, should it please you. Till then, adieu. Yours, humbles, D. Bloodmarsh. I stare at the screen and reread the letter several more times. Amanda, can you help me with something? Aww. Dad, for the last time, I'm not popping your back. Ew. N no, no. Can you interpret this for me? I turn the computer to Amanda and she squints at Damien's message. I just don't understand NetSpeak. Like, is this how you kids communicate with each other now? Oh, totally. This is a hot new thing. See, Dad, kids go over saying lol and lamau or whatever, and decided that they needed to do is bring it back to the 1800s. So what do I do? Where's your pen and quill? What? Did you forget to unpack the pen and quill? Dad, how will we address the nobleman in regards to your upcoming debutante ball? Okay, now I know you're messing with me. <laughs> Father, without a proper chaperone, we'll never end up with a suitor worthy of our land, or our dowry, or... So you read Pride and Prejudice, Prejudice for School one time, and now you're reciting things you know about it back to me, aren't you? Like, the first five pages, and then I read a review of the movie. Still gotta be, though. Great, so what do I say to Damien? I got this. Amanda reaches over to me and types on the keyboard. Sure thing, dude. <laughs> Regards. Yes. Broken. Amanda hits send and smiles at me. Well, I suppose that's that. <laughs> I think the short walk over to Damien's house. Well, I guess you can't really call it a house. It's more of a manor? Estate? The gothic architecture looms above the other homes in the cul-de-sac. I love these gargoyles. I walk past a couple of gargoyles guarding the front door and look around for a doorbell. There doesn't seem to be one. I pull the large, ornately carved bat's head door knocker back and a hollow sound echoes throughout the house as I strike it against the door. I wait several moments before the door slowly creaks open. It's a little creepy, but I enter the home and take a few steps into the foyer, noting the oil portraits of who I assume are dead relatives hanging on the wall. As I'm admiring them, the front door slams shut behind me. Uh, hello? Silence. An oil lamp in the corner flickers dimly, casting ominous shadows against the wall. Why do I feel like all the people in these paintings are staring straight at me? Why is it so cold in here? Where's Damien? Rogan, pleasure to have you in my home. I look up and see Damien standing at the top of a majestic staircase with a walking candle holder. What's, uh, what's with the door slamming shut? Oh, sorry, there was a draft. And the door creaking open when I knocked? <laughs> I accidentally left the door unlocked. And the creepy oil paintings? I like oil paintings. Right. Right. Please, let me show you around. Okay. Fucking delightful. Damien leads me around his house, showcasing his parlor, sitting room, auxiliary sitting room, and the parlor again for some reason. Oh. This is one of the older homes on the block, yes, but nowhere near as old as the architecture might suggest. Oh. Though extens through extensive renovations, I've been able to craft a residence that is both historically accurate to the Victorian period and equipped with the amenities of any modern dwelling. We walk past the door covered in bumper stickers, caution tape, and a black parade poster. Did they listen to My Chemical Romance of the Victorian Era? That's my son's room. You know how the rebellious teenage years are. Onward, onward, there's more to see. 
We reach a door at the end of the hall that Damien opens with a flourish. And this is the library. Oh, lovely collection here. Sunlight streams in from the floor to ceiling arched windows. That one's not arched. The walls are lined with packed bookshelves and even more books are scattered over the period appropriate furniture. Damien is clearly really proud of this room. Look out the window, look at the butterflies, pick up a book. Look at the butterflies. I walk up to the glass display of pinned bugs on the wall. It's pretty impressive. Nice bugs. <laughs> I pinned them all myself. Maybe I could show you how sometime. I'm concerned I would stick the pin right through my finger. Ah, the pinner's gambit. Is that a thing? No. <laughs> I walk to the window and I'm greeted by a beautiful view of Damien's backyard. It showcases a beautiful view of the rest of the cul-de-sac. Hey, I can see Craig on his lawn. He's doing push-ups with his daughters on his back. Damn. He sees me and waves happily, doing push-ups with one hand now. Damn. Oh. Did you know that Victorian spent at least 20 hours a week gazing longingly out of full-length windows? Wait, really? No, but Victorians did appreciate telling a good joke. You are wonderful, did you know that? You know, Brogan, in the Victorian era there were some controversy surrounding reading. Many people thought the more tawdry novels would, would encourage youth into a life of crime and would cause too much of a distraction from work and school. I pull out a book at random and examine its worn cover. Opening it, I turn to a random page and read aloud. Naruto struggled against the chains that Sasuke had bound him with. Shirtless and out of breath, he looked up at Sasuke. Sasuke smirked, unbuttoning his ninja pants. Okay, I think that's enough. Damien snacks the book shut and steps the book shut and puts it back onto the shelf. That's a rare book for my private collection. <laughs> Please, will you join me for tea? I follow Damien to a sitting room where finger foods have already been set out on a beautiful seared silver tray. I take a seat on one of the high back chairs as Damien pours and serves me some tea. I can't believe we're having a high tea. I never thought I'd get to do this. <laughs> Damien smiles to himself. What? Oh. It's a common misconception that high tea refers to the wealth or class of the people enjoying it, when in fact the high refers to both the later time of the day that the working class had to enjoy tea and the height of the tables on which they're served. Oh. oh. My dear friend, we're currently enjoying afternoon tea. That's, uh, informative. <laughs> Damien takes a seat next to me and serves me a tiny sandwich. It, your home is amazing, and I love it. It seems to really put a lot of work into this place. The, thank you. No one's ever complimented my home before. Oh, but you don't have a lot of appreciative guests, apparently. Hell, I can barely get matching salt and pepper shakers in my place, and look at what you've done. Kinda jealous. That's very generous of you to say. What got you so interested in goth stuff? Well, when I was a young boy, my father... <laughs> did he take you into the city? Sorry? Haha, <laughs> did you guys see a marching band? I'm afraid I don't understand. <laughs> Serious? <laughs> of course. But it, it's, you know, the song. Amanda made me listen to it. Seriously? I'd love to see a marching band. <laughs> Nevertheless, I've always had a love for art, history, and fashion. What started off as a small hobby of collecting taxidermied animals grew into sort of an obsession. It's a privilege to be able to appreciate the lives and culture of those who came before us, I think. Why not go all the way? I like not dying when I catch a cold. <laughs> he takes a sip of tea. Oh. I can acknowledge that there were many terrible things around the Victorian era and try to live a life that strictly aligns with those ideals would be admittedly horrid. Yeah. And I think, But I think it carries, it takes a critical mind to truly appreciate something to the fullest, to be cognizant of its flaws and love it all the same. Tell me, Brogan, do you have any hobbies? Oh man, I do, but I don't know if I care about anything the way you care about this stuff. Well, I'd love to hear about your interest. Hearing someone talk about the things they're passionate about is intriguing, and quite honestly, rather attractive. Oh. Please, do tell me about your hobbies. Quick, sound sophisticated! I like watching soap making videos on the internet. <laughs> Honestly, they're very satisfying. Soap is, uh, an important advancement in modern society, getting rid of germs and stuff. I would say that the people who make soap are the true heroes here. To watch them work is an honor. <laughs> I, um, tried making soap with Amanda once, and we both had to go to the doctor for the rashes, which I guess shows goes to show that we should leave it to the professionals. We finish our tea and finger sandwiches. Come, I have one more thing to show you. Damien takes me around the back of his home where a variety of flowers flourish in a beautifully landscaped rose. A small stone path weaves through it and butterflies flit lazily through the air. My garden. It's beautiful. Thank you. Victorians took flowers and floral arrangements very seriously. 
You see, it was considered uncouth to discuss personal and romantic relationships in public, so lovers and friends alike would use bouquets to send secret messages to each other. Each flower and plant is symbolic of different feelings. Huh. Even more interesting is that one flower could mean different things depending on the other plants it was paired with. One had to be extremely careful, as even the style in which the ribbon was tied around the bouquet affected the message. Hmm. How do they keep track of it all? Damien leans down and plucks a gorgeous, bright orange flower off a vine. Lilium bulbiferum, the orange lily. What do you think this one means? My loins are ablaze, thou art the tightest. Three cheers for sweet revenge. Wait, didn't that one literally mean... The orange lily is actually symbolic of pure hatred. Well, and that's precisely why floral arrangement is so challenging. What's your favorite type of flower? Snapdragon's honey flow. I feel like I feel like this guy would like sunflowers. They remind me of sunshine, and then you can eat the seeds as a delicious snack. What a practical choice. My stomach rumbles. Aw oh, man, now I want sunflower seeds. I'll have to remember that when I put together a bouquet for you. He he would put together a bouquet for me? Nobody's ever given me a bouquet before. I follow Damien down the footpath and admire more of his beautiful flowers. Suddenly a phone rings. Oh, Brogan, will you excuse me? I must take this. He pulls the cell phone out of his pocket. I'm a little surprised it's not a rotary phone. Go for it. Damien smiles and walks back to the house. I take a deep breath and enjoy the heavily perfumed air. What a lovely yard. How far does it go? <laughs> this makes me wish I'd put a little more effort into that garden Amanda and I tried to start one time. Our watermelons grew to the size of cherry tomatoes and then immediately died. Oh, hey, a gargoyle. Oh, no, I knocked over the gargoyle. <laughs> oh, no. Shave with the grain. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, oh, oh. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Like that, and then... Like that? No, wait. Okay, wait, those go in the back. Oh, I can flip them around. Hold on. Flip it around. Flip it around. Oh, make it go upside down. There we go. Like that. Okay. And then... Boom. I didn't do great there. <laughs> Our secret. <laughs> Always carry a pocket knife. Good advice. Pocket knives are very useful. I dropped my favorite one in my pond the other day and I got so sad. It's like a really gross pond. I've been, I've been trying to work on it, but... Uh, well, that was a close one. Uh-oh, here comes Damien, he looks upset. Ugh. Rogan, my sincerest apologies to have kept you waiting. This is an urgent matter that I must attend to, so I'm afraid I must take my leave. No problem, dude. Everything all right? Damien worries the hem of his coat co hem of his coat with his fingers and looks away. Everything is perfectly fine, but I, uh, it's Lucian. What's wrong? He appears to have, well, his teacher needs me to come to the school post-haste. Do you need help? Oh, no, you don't have to. Let me come with you. Us dads gotta stick together. You're right. This is one of Lucian's more elaborate stunts. I would greatly treasure having another parent by my side. Let's go. Um... Damien and I walk into the school and are immediately greeted by an anxious-looking Hugo. Uh... Hey, Damien, you're here in record time. I wouldn't miss it for the world, dear friend. Wow, whatever it is, it doesn't seem like this Hugo and Damien's first time to the My Kids Are In Trouble rodeo. <laughs> Both of them have little punk kids. Huh. What is it this time? Oh. This, Damien, you have to see to believe. Damien and I fall into step behind Hugo, who leads us through the busy corridors of the school. We pass by several classes in session, and I vaguely wonder if Amanda's around. Hugo eventually ushers us into a small boiler room with a flight of rickety stairs leading down into darkness. Watch your step. I can hear faint voices drifting up from the basement. They don't sound happy. As I'm led into the depths of the school, I recall the antics I got into as an angsty middle schooler. At least I had enough sense to stay out of creepy basements. We find another teacher in a boiler room tucked away in the back of the basement. With him are Lucien and Ernest, Hugo's son. Lucien has a bloody nose. Thanks for coming. I can't make heads or tails of this. I look around the scene of the crime and see a bunch of bricks and some masonry tools scattered around. What happened here? Ernest punched me. <laughs> Lucian tried to kill me. What? The room falls silent. I was not trying to kill you, dumbass. I was trying to build the brick wall around you and see what would happen. You promised me there was wine down here. You tricked me. 
Whoa, 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 wait a second, Lucian. Did you try to cask of Amontillado, Ernest? I am neither confirming nor denying that. I turned to Damien and whispered to him, What's, uh, what's cask of Amontillado? It's a classic Edgar Allan Poe short story where a man gets his enemy drunk, lures him down into his cellar with the promise of wine of a fine vintage, then buries him alive behind a brick wall. It's a lovely story. <laughs> so wait, Lucian, you tried to do that to him? I was curious to see how it would turn out. I wasn't actually going to leave him there. What was the thought process here? That Ernest was just going to sit still while you slowly built the tomb around him? Well, it worked for like 20 minutes because he's an idiot, but then he realized that I had lied about the wine. And you were there cackling maniacally. That sort of tipped me off. Ernest, 20 minutes? Dead. It took you 20 minutes? Son, we just did an entire two-week unit on the cask of Amontillado, and it took you 20 minutes to realize Lucien was leading you into an elaborate ruse? Did you even read the story? <laughs> read the first five pages, then read a review of the movie. Man, it's Shane. only five pages long, and there is no movie. Haha, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. I paid Lucien to read it for oh, me. Oh, no. Actually, he didn't even pay me. So when you think about it, this is me teaching him a lesson. Damien and Hugo both had their heads in their hands. <laughs> You guys are always telling me to engage in the literature, and I did. I don't see a problem here. Alright, I'm filing this under what the hell. Don't do whatever that was. Again, you two are both suspended for a week. Ernest and Lucy in high five. <laughs> the teacher starts to stomp off up the stairs. Hugo, I'll cover your class. Take your son home. Mr. Bloodmarch, you too. Thank you for your mediation. We all head up the stairs and out of the school in tense silence. Now, suspension is like the, one of the stupidest punishments. Lucy and Damien and I all pull, uh, Lucy and Damien and I all pile into my car and begin the drive home. Lucy immediately puts his head up and stares out the window angrily. I'm not going to therapy again. Huh. I know, son. It's entirely up to you whether or not you want to go. But I care about you, and I can see that you're struggling. So if you do decide that you would like to speak to a professional about your feelings, we can do that too. Maybe you can spend this next week looking for a summer job, hmm? I know how much you want to own a car. I can't believe Damien's keeping his cool. I'm impressed. Mm, fine. Thanks for not freaking out too hard. Hmm. I love you, son. Lucien continues staring out the window. We'll be too. We spend the rest of the drive in relative silence. Aw. The moment we pull into the driveway, Lucien hops out of the car, slams the door, and runs inside. Hmm. Didn't expect to have that conversation in front of you. He and I have a lot we need to work out. It's all right. All things considered, Lucien's bricklaying was pretty good. So here's your, there's your silver lining. There is that, yes. I'll be just going through a phase. Really admire I handled that. Does this sort of thing happen a lot? Uh, I right, handle that. You were a lot more diplomatic with him than I would have been. I just want what's best for him. And I don't think yelling at him would do any of us any favors. It rarely does. You're a good dad. See you around soon. Oh. It would be my honor and my pleasure. Damien bows with a flourish. Classy. Huh. I love him. I come home to find Amanda curled up on the couch with a blanket watching TV. I, I plop down next to her. Yo. What you watching? Tiny House Hunting, Tiny House Hunting Brothers Extreme Edition. Oh, I hate this show. The couple on screen bickers back and forth while standing in an extremely small house made out of recycled bottles. The tiny house hunting brothers watch them with a bemused expression, both of their heads touching the low ceiling. I told you I wanted a two-bed, two-bath, shabby chic cottage. This house doesn't even have a bathroom. But honey, the outhouse is only 20 yards away. It's not that bad. I am not pooping outside, Greg. Why don't they just get a regular sized house? I... I don't know? How's afternoon tea go? It got strained. We had to go to the school to pick up Lucian since he tried to. He lured Ernest down to the cellar with the promise of a fine vintage and then tried to break him, into... break him up into the wall, right? How do you know about that? Has everyone read this story except for me? Lucian live streamed the entire thing. This entire day is beyond me. But otherwise, it was a fun day. The Damien guy's a character, but he's really good company and a surprisingly diplomatic dad. I dig his style. You know what? Me too. Hell yeah. It's okay to cry if you're feeling sad. Date complete. Cell phone hostel, protective dad, fang, goth, basement, amontillado. That hey, was just dang. bricky. <laughs> bricky as in the Victorian term for good. Bricky. <laughs> Welcome. You've got dads. Oh, Dadmazon? Oh my god, this is Steven from Dadmazon. I'm out front with your delivery. 
Oh, okay, yes, I'll be right down. Wait, no, sorry, I need to put on pants first. I can't find my pants, but I'm wrapped from waist down in a duvet. Are you cool with that? I can come back tomorrow. No, no, wait, I'll be right down. I found some sensible caprice. Don't trust anyone who likes their meat. Well done. Also, don't trust anyone who likes their meat. Super rare. Oh, I got a package. Wonder what that is. Oh, I bet it's that package of socks I ordered. I open up the box and start pulling the packing peanuts out. Man, these socks reek. Okay, it's definitely not socks. It's... Butterflies? Oh boy, I almost don't even know what, want to know what Amanda was planning on doing with these. Hey Amanda, your box of dead butterflies is here. What's up, are you sacrificing them? What? You ordered butterflies? You can order dead butterflies online? Wait, so these aren't yours? Uh, no, but I'm definitely ordering some right now. Um, okay, I love you. <laughs> and take a look at the box again. Oh, this is addressed to Damien's house. Bring the box to Damien. I should take it over to him. I jog over to Damien's house with the box. I pull his- I pull back his door knocker, but suddenly the door opens. Mr. Monroe, what do I owe the pleasure? Whoa, how'd you know I was about to knock? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> oh, okay, uh, anyways. I think this got delivered to my house by mistake. I hand him the box and his face lights up. What a wonderful surprise! I was just about to send a strongly worded letter to the courier service about this. Many thanks. I, uh, not to pry, but what are you gonna do with those butterflies? Well, he's gonna pin them. Would you like to see? Alarm bells ring in my head. This is how you die, Brogan Monroe. Sure. Damien leads me into a study where he set up some sort of workstation. Above his desk is a wall of pin butterflies, moths, and beetles. I'm guessing these parts happened out of order. Oh, wow, that's really something, Damien. I'm quite proud of my little collection. You do all this yourself? Of course. I find it rather relaxing. How do you... It's simple. Here, let me show you. These aren't ready quite yet. They need to be rehydrated overnight so they're easier to work with. I have some over here that are ready to pin. Damien takes a seat at his desk while I hover behind him. He picks up a little triangular paper package and snips off the edges. He pulls out an all-black butterfly and shows it to me. I'm rather excited about this one. It's a turquoise swallowtail. He gently opens the wings, spreading the butterfly out on the table. The backs of the wings are a gorgeous, iridescent green color. Oh, and the pigment on this one is so nice, too. Anyways, fitting a butterfly is actually quite simple. It just requires a delicate touch. First, I'll put a pin through the thorax. Damien slides a pin through, the pin through the middle of the butterfly and places the butterfly on a piece of styrofoam. He carefully arranges the antenna with forceps and begins placing paper and more pins on it and around it. He does this so effortlessly that it's almost hypnotic. I have a frame here that I think this one will look quite pretty in, but I need to let it sit for a couple of days until it's ready. And then what? I remove all of the pins and put it on display with the others. I take a closer look at Damien's collection. One with bright blue wings keeps drawing my eye. This one's so pretty. Damien takes it off the wall. <laughs> ah, yes, that's a blue morpho. One of my favorites, too. He hands a small frame to me. Here, I think this would look lovely in your home. Oh, I couldn't take this. <sighs> I insist, believe me, I am more than enough. Thank you. If you ever have an interest in pinning some insects yourself, you know where to find me. <laughs> I, I think I'll leave that up to you. I feel like I'd probably break them in half with my butterfingers. Mm. Nonsense, you have beautiful, steady hands. You would make a fine taxidermist. Am I blushing? <laughs> Damien walks me to the door and gives me a warm smile as I oh. leave. Dude, take care of yourself, Rogan. Thanks for allowing me to share my odd little hobby with you. You are a treasure. Welcome. You've got bad. I love all of them. Okay, next up, Hugo, the teacher. The nerd. This guy is just a fantastic muscles. Document is art history. <laughs> Super agree with the e-reader thing. The only acceptable time and place for decaf coffee is never ended in the trash. <laughs> I never get to Hugo's dad book page and type out a message. Hey Hugo, great seeing you at the barbecue. Want to hang out sometime? I wait for a few minutes before the computer dings. I am so glad you messaged me, and I definitely want to hang out sometime. But I have a favor to ask. Our class is going on a field trip to the aquarium today. One of our chaperones called in sick. Is there any possible way you could come by and replace them? <laughs> An opportunist. I completely understand if you don't want to or can't make it, but I'm going to be honest with you here. It's a middle school class. I need as much help as I can get. I think about it for a moment. Man, it's a lot of screaming kids that I'd be accountable for. And they're in middle school. Arguably the worst age to be. Amanda silently charges into the kitchen and pours herself a bowl of cereal. Morning, Amanda. 
Morning, Pops. Hey, how was middle school for you? Bad, but nobody likes middle school. It's three years of bad acne, crying, and being genuinely, generally terrible. Everyone sucks, no self-awareness. It's just a bunch of hormonal teenagers locked in a gross old building for 40 plus hours a week doing long division and starting fights over, like, I don't know, pizza day? Top 40s, Pop? Middle schoolers should be avoided at all costs. What was your middle school experience like? I did not like it. I had my first crush in middle school, and I'm still bitter about it. Alexis Stuggs, you hurt me, and I'll never forget. What'd she do to you? I stare off into middle distance, remembering the 24 hours that we dated and the three times that we held hands between class periods. Then I remember the bitter betrayal, her leaving me for Arnold Birmingham, and making me eat dirt in front of her. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> See, middle schoolers are reprehensible. Wait, why are you asking me about middle school? Oh, Mr. Vega requested my help to chaperone his middle school class to the aquarium. Just wanted to know what I was in for. You get to go to the aquarium? Are you kidding me? The last field trip I got to go on was to the clam chowder factory. They didn't even give us clam chowder. They give us square pizza at the clam chowder factory. Oh, square pizza. Oh, is that why you won't eat clam chowder anymore? No, it's because Bobby Wellingham threw up in one of the vats of clam chowder, and I'm the only one who saw it happen. Ew. It haunts me. Ugh. Right, let's leave that story firmly in the past. Anyway, you should just do it. Mr. Vega sounds like he could really use the help. Plus, he get to hang out with cool fish. I would do it for the aquarium. I love the aquariums. Amanda, I get kind of weird about aquariums. The ocean makes me nervous. What, are you worried about a whale that's going to pop out of the touch tank and swallow you whole? Don't you put fear in my heart. Well, do they have penguins there? Yes, they have penguins there. Then it's settled. Penguins outweigh fear of the ocean. I sit back down at the computer and let Hugo know that I'm available. He tells me to meet him at the aquarium and gives me the address. I grab my keys and kiss Amanda on the forehead before I head out. I arrive at the aquarium to find that the school buses have beaten me there. Preteens huddle around their teachers in small groups, yelling at each other and goofing off. Every teacher looks like they're at their wit's end. Hugo jogs up to me, looking frazzled. I'm so glad you're here. Hugo! Uh. It's been a debacle all morning. We're short-handed and most of the kids won't stop screaming, as I'm sure you know is the case with all middle schoolers. I was the Amanda at 12. I'm all too familiar. Great. Well, it's you and me chaperoning a group of 10 kids. They're over here. Hugo walks me over to a gaggle of preteens. We're all sitting on the ground, playing with their phones. They're not even kicking- they're not kicking each other like some of the other groups, so we're off to a good start. Mm. Can you guys put your phones away? All of the kids look up for a moment to stare at Hugo, and then go back to texting. At least they're quiet? Oh. Too quiet. These guys are up to something. I can feel it. There's no way. They're too busy thinking about not getting food stuck in their braces to pull any stunts. It's middle school, after mm. all. We'll see. Ah, uh, he's got that teacher's intuition. Ah, look at the fun aquarium. The classes start f filing into the aquarium, and Hugo hands out massive stapled packets of paper to each kid. These are due at the end of the field trip. Yes, this will be for a grade. No, you can't borrow a pencil. The kids collectively groan and grab the sheets from Hugo. What's in the hey. packet? Honestly, it's just busy work so that the teachers can have a moment's reprieve. I think one of the questions asks them to sit quietly for ten minutes to think about the Great Barrier Reef. Teacher hacks. I like that. Wait, I thought you were an English teacher. What does the aquarium have to do with books? Mm -hmm. We just did a unit on the old man in the sea. Nothing quite like introducing kids to the futile perseverance of the human spirit by making them pet stingrays. Ah. Gives us time to check out some of the exhibits as well. Come on, they have a phenomenal selection of tropical fish. While the kids sit on the floor and pretend to do their assignments while they text, Hugo and I wander over to a large tank filled with brightly colored fish. Hugo points to a brown and white fish with long oh. spines. That right there is a lionfish. Did you know that their stomachs can expand up to 30 times in size? Also, they're an invasive species in Florida right now, and they're supposed to be delicious, so it's like kind of a good problem to have, and I really want to know what they taste like anyway. Whoa. Their spines are venomous, too. Nature is hardcore. Ah. You think that's bad? Take a look at this one over here. Hugo points to a spiny, grumpy-looking fish hanging under the bottom ah. of the tank. That's a stonefish, the most venomous, venomous fish in the world. And they just, like, keep it here? Oh, they're relatively harmless as long as you don't step on them. What happens if you step mm. on them? Tissue necrosis. Cool. Hey. Nature's wild. Man, Hugo seems to know a lot about fish. I feel the overwhelming need to impress him. Hey, see that fish over there? Mm. That one? Yeah, that's the American longfish, blue nose wiggly fish. Humphead wrasse. Yeah? That is a fish. Did you know that? Paranormal fish trivia, psychiatric fish trivia, political fish trivia. What what does that mean? This is the only species of fish known to develop clinical depression. Wait, are you serious? Serious is a heart attack. We're talking fish here. There's no time for jokes. 
Oh, damn it. That's a clownfish. Oh, damn it. He didn't get the joke. <laughs> right. <laughs> we lead the kids to another room. Sharks, sea turtles, eels, and other marine life swim around in a massive floor-to-ceiling aquarium. The kids begin trying to take selfies with the sharks. Hugo leaves my side to separate two kids who start fighting over a Capri Sun. I walk around the room, reading the tiny little blurbs about different fish swimming inside of the enclosure. After a while, I look around and see Hugo again. Uh, my favorite one? I'm having a hard time choosing. I don't know. I love them all. I haven't gone on all the dates yet. But, like, I, I love a lot of them. After a while, I look around and see Hugo again. He's gazing up at the aquarium in childlike wonder. The ripples in the water cast blue, moving shadows across his face. For someone surrounded by angry, hormonal preteens, he looks completely peaceful. He looks really cute in this light. I hope he doesn't notice me staring. Wow. Ah. I walk over to join him. Beautiful, isn't it? Rather stare at you. We can learn a great deal from Mother Ocean. Are those two sharks kissing? <laughs> Great many mysteries lie in the ocean. Truly is fascinating to be able to observe it in a setting such as this. That's a very astute point, Brogan. We stand together for a moment, admiring the wonders of marine life. Hell yeah. We eventually make our way to the touch tank room, which seems to be the only thing the kids are actually interested in. The tank is filled with a variety of horseshoe crabs, sea urchins, stingrays, and small fish. I stand around the edges of the tank and keep a wary distance from the sea life. Who knows what kind of nefarious plans those horseshoe crabs have for my well-moisturized hands. Hugo rolls up his sleeve and sticks his hand in the water. Don't you want to pet some rays, Brogan? Oh, I, I think I'm good. I don't really... I, I think I should just stay over here and admire them from a respectable distance. Come on, it'll be fun and informative. Don't make fun of me, but I'm scared to touch them. I get weird when there's no glass separating us. I don't know what any of those things are, but I get the feeling it will probably bite me and my delicious hands if given the chance. Nothing in this tank can hurt you. The stingrays have their bars removed, the horseshoe crabs only eat little clams, and the anemones are perfectly safe to touch. Against my better judgment, I approach the tank. Slowly dipping my hand into the cold water, I touch a stingray as it glides past me. See? Not so bad. Feels like a fun, slimy leather. Things get a lot less scary when you learn more about them, right? I dive my hand back into the touch tank with a renewed vigor for ocean life. I poke at some urchins and feel the hard carapace of horseshoe crab. My hand brushes against Hugo's as we reach for the same anemone. I pull away, flushing. Hugo smiles at me. Hey, you're supposed to be touching the fish. Sorry, I just get a little carried away as some t Wait. That girl over there looks suspicious. Why is that? Are backpacks usually that wet? Hold on. Susan? Susan, get back here. Hugo runs after a middle schooler and catches her before she can make it to the exit. Wanna tell me what's in the bag? Uh, textbooks? Wanna tell me what's really in the bag? Susan won't budge. I walk over to Hugo and the girl. I think I, I think he might need a bad cop. Look, kid, we don't have time for games here. There's easily five to ten of the clink. I'm not a free kid, <laughs> Whatever it is, it goes back into the touch tank. Now. You're not a teacher. You can't tell me what to do. Yes, well, I am. Can you please put the bag down? Next time, we won't say please. Susan glares at Hugo for a moment before dropping her book bag on the floor. It lands with a wet slap. We stare at it for a moment before it starts to move. Hugo leans down and absits the backpack. A horseshoe crab frantically scuttles out and across the floor. An employee swoops in, scoops it up, and places it back into the tank. Places it back into the tank. She gives us a disapproving look. Jesus, Susan, what was your plan? I was trying to free him. To where? Outside, where he was gonna die? Susan, go back to your group, we'll discuss this later. Yeah, and hands where we can see him. Susan sulks off, leaving me alone with Hugo. He gives me a pat on the shoulder. Middle schoolers have sticky hands, I doubt that's the first time that's happened here. Or the last. In the next room, we see a variety of smaller tanks, sea urchins, tiny fish, and a rainbow of beautiful underwater plant life surround us. Ah. Look over there! Hugo points to some seahorses gathered at the bottom of a tank. One of them is in the middle of giving oh. birth. That's actually the male seahorse. Sort of takes fatherhood to a new level, doesn't it? Hey kids, come check this out. There's a male seahorse giving birth. A low murmur from the students. They just jump back on their phones. Ah. Fun fact, male seahorses can even give birth and then get pregnant in the same day. Man, we thought we had it hard. Ah. I wonder if they have to deal with their kids' awkward teenage years, too. All however many thousand of them. You seem to know a lot about marine life, Hugo. Okay, yeah, question answered. Hugo's my favorite. I love Hugo. He's, a, he's wonderful. Oh. It's not really my specialty, but I do make a point to learn as much as possible, whatever I can. You fucking nerd! You're, you're the best, and you know that. I think that learning shouldn't end when you leave school. We should challenge ourselves to find out more about the things we don't understand every day of our lives. 
because if you stop learning, I don't think you'll ever be able to grow or change as a person. Good point. But I still don't trust the ocean. <laughs> we'll get there. We finally make our way to my favorite part of the tour, the Arctic exhibit. Do we get to see the penguins? Aww. Yes, we get to see the penguins. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> Our group of kids runs around at the exhibits. They won't stop tapping on the glass of the puffin enclosure, trying to get their attention. For at least a few moments, teachers, chaperones, and students alike seem to be having a great time. What was I so worried about? This isn't too bad. What? Hugo suddenly grabs my arm. Oh my god, there's a student in the penguin enclosure. <laughs> Wait, just kidding, it's very bad. <laughs> is it one of ours? <sighs> it most certainly is. Molly Henderson, Susan's friend. I look over to those penguins and see a determined-looking kid crouching behind a rock. She's hiding just out of sight of one of the employees. Oh, yeah, I just, I, I love nerd characters. I love nerd characters who are all obsessed with learning and knowing specific knowledge. It's just cute. She's, she's hiding out. I look over to the penguins and see a determined looking kid crouching behind a rock. She's hiding just out of sight of one of the employees. Over on the side of the enclosure, I see a door to the exhibit ajar. Was it in box this whole time? We gotta stop her before the staff sees and bans our school for life. Hugo looks around. I'll create a distraction. Hugo runs for the puppet exhibit and dresses the entire room. Everybody, 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 I have an announcement. The whole room turns towards Hugo. Um, here's a few facts I bet you didn't know about penguins. Everybody just stares at Hugo, confused. Well, this is my shot. I run into the enclosure and I'm greeted by a cold blast of air. Psst, hey! The girl whips around to look at me. Her nose is pink from the cold. Can't be in here. Neither can you! I try to walk over to the girl, but the ground is so icy that I just end up slipping. I catch myself before I hit the ground, but the girl still laughs mm. at me. Contrary to popular belief, penguins are birds. Birds are traditionally known to fly, but penguins cannot. So I can understand some confusion when we're discussing the birdness of penguins. The crowd is still somewhat and somehow enraptured. Kid, what are you even doing? I'm letting the penguins go. They deserve freedom. Where are they even going to go? They're gonna live in my closet. <laughs> like pen pen. Look, I don't even have the time to argue about this. We gotta get out of here. Not until I save a penguin. <laughs> Little known fact is that penguins only live in cold climates, uh, which, with some exceptions, so they don't all live in cold climates if you're splitting hairs here. Did I mention that they don't fly? <laughs> the crowd is starting to lose interest. I'm running out of time. Lay down the law, try to relate to her, briber. Relate? I think about all the time I released all of the feeder mice from the pet store. It was a disaster. I was six, but it was a disaster. Molly, you know, life can be cruel. Money, give me money. <laughs> I will give you $20 right now if you leave with me. Molly thinks for a second. Okay, well, give it to me right now. I reach into my pocket and pull out everything I have, examining each bill. Okay, well, I have $12 and some chains. Also, there's a button here. Is that enough? Pay me the other eight later. We have a deal. <laughs> this little scammer. We move to shake on our agreement before I suddenly realize there's a wave of penguins on their way out of the enclosure. We're gonna have to block these birds. Oh, minigame? Okay, uh, how, how do I do it? How, uh, oh my god. Okay, I have, to, I have to use the mouse. Get out of here. No! No, one of them escaped! Ah, oh, came in from a weird angle. This is adorable. Oh my god, oh, there are two... There's too many of them. No! Stay in! No, stay in! No, one of the ones gonna escape now! No! Oh god, a couple of them escaped. Okay, three of them got out. So that wasn't the best. Bribery works! I don't think I should have gotten an S, so it would have been if none of them got out. Make sure to sweep under your tent so you don't sleep on rocks. Pay your bills early. Oh, glad that's over. Just in time, too. It looks like Hugo is wrapped up in his diversionary peng- is wrapping up his diversionary uh. penguin speech. And that's why I think that penguins are one of the best animals in the world. A few people in the audience clap out of a sense of duty. Everyone starts dispersing. Hugo spots us from across the way and runs <sighs> over. Molly, what were you doing in there? I was liberating animals, Mr. Vega. You realize that penguins can only survive in arctic temperatures, right? You would have had a dead penguin on your hands. Well, um, it was a thought that counts. No, Molly, it wasn't. 
Molly turns to me. You owe me eight dollars. What? <laughs> Just pay you later, kid. Molly runs off towards Susan. I suppose so they can compare animal thief mm -hmm. notes. You're not off the hook, Molly. Mm -hmm. Broken. Did you just bribe a child? I bribed a child. You can't play it by the rules when there's penguins on the line. Listen, man, we've all done dark things in our lives. I'm not the young, bright-eyed youth I used to be. That person believed in a world where you wouldn't have to bribe children to save a penguin. That <laughs> Me today knows different. I only wish I could go back. Let's just get through the day and get out of here. When the day finally coming to a close, a whole field trip is ushered through the gift shop and we make our way back out of the school out to the school buses. As we leave the aquarium and the kids load onto the buses, Hugo pulls mm. me aside. Hey, Brogan, thank you so much for helping out today. You're a lifesaver. It was no problem. It was actually kind of fun. Let me take you out next time to make it up to you. You like cheese boards? Hell, hell yeah, cheese boards. There's nothing that is more satisfying than a good cheese board. I love cheese boards. Great. Well, I gotta go make sure the kids don't steal anything else. See you around. I walk inside to find the house empty. Hmm, I wonder where the pan is at. Before I know it, Amanda pops in through the front door. What's you up to tonight? Just doing some homework. How was the aquarium? It was an adventure. Some kid tried to steal a penguin. We've all been there. I had to run in and grab her before even the employees saw. You got to go to the penguin enclosure? Did he steal a penguin for us? Amanda, no penguins were stolen thanks to the valiant efforts of myself and Mr. Vega. It was nice getting to spend some time with Hugo, though. I'm surprised he helped complete a covert up. He's usually kind of a... Kind of a what? Kind of a stick in the mud? He's actually pretty cool. I had a good time with him. Alright, too much adventure to me today. I'm gonna go rest my eyes. Oh. You mean, take a nap? That's a difference. You'll learn when you become a father. Anyone who tells you that a drink isn't manly, it's never known heartache. Date complete! Grilled dad, cell phone holster, colon, mustache, bribe, fish. Yay! Phenomenal. <laughs> Asiago getter, oh my god. Hey! Hey, Brogan, what are your feelings about poker? Beyond hardly knowing her. Poker, I hardly know her? There it is. Well, good talk. <laughs> Wait, actually, you like poker. I just saw the joke and I had to take the shot. <laughs> Please, Matt, I am a dad. I am contractually obligated. No, no, I get that. Anyway, we've been playing weekly poker games, and I figured I should send it in by your way. That sounds great. I love losing money. Cool, dude. See you soon. Lose that money. I don't know how to play poker. <laughs> so let's see how this goes. Always help a friend in need. Matt invited me to a poker night at Joseph's house. I put on my going out coat and walk over. Across the way, I spot Matt, who's walking over from his own house. He's got a case of beer under his arm. Crap, I should have brought something. Hey, man. Ah, crap, I should have brought something. Haha, <laughs> no worries, man. It's your first time. Just bring a full wallet. How long have you guys been at this for? Years, buddy. Just a nice way to keep in touch with the guys. It's never really high stakes. They pass through the fence and closing Joseph's yard. Craig, Brian, and Joseph hover around the patio, drinking beer and chatting. Robert sits in the corner, brooding as usual. Oh. Brogan, glad you can make it. Wait, Brogan, glad you can make oh. it. So am I. I'm psyched to take all your money. Just like old times. Ah, Craig's the resident shark. We prefer the term, person who's good at poker. <laughs> I'm well aware. Craig's always been suspiciously good at poker. Are you still as terrible as you were in college? I am still terrible at poker. <laughs> My tell is a sustained, childlike giggle. There's no way you're as bad as Joseph. Joseph shrugs. This is basically my tithing. I'm giving back to the community. <laughs> Plus, I'm happy to just sit here and eat all of Brian's snacks. Yeah. Guess who brought pigs in a blanket? Not Craig. Mm -hmm. Hey, my chia seed and granola energy bars are just as delicious. Uh. Everybody <laughs>, laughs. Let's just get the game going. Hey. We all take a seat at the table and Matt starts stealing cards. The first couple rounds go by easily as I'm getting the hang of things, but it's obvious that Craig is running the show here. Craig, how did you get so good at this? It's pretty easy. You just start getting a feel for everybody's tell. Like, Matt will scratch his ear. Hey. Brian adjusts his pants when he's trying to lie. Now, well, wait a second. And I think you just loudly announce to the whole room when you have a good hand. Yeah, yep, yeah, that's me. What's Joseph's tell? Everything. Literally everything. That man is an open book. He couldn't lie if he tried. Well, at least I have God on my side. See, you can't even say that with a straight face. <laughs> what about Robert? Hmm. Honestly, the man's an enigma. Robert raises a glass of whiskey to us in a solemn salute. 
I think he'd wipe the floor with us if he actually tried. And I'm just here because I enjoy the company. Robert pulls out his phone and stares at it. Robert, is that a flip phone? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> what, are you a drug dealer now? Yeah, what do you need? Horse speed? Two on the okay. I can get you all the street stuff easy, but if you're looking for something exotic or designer, it's maybe 72 hours and a favor called. Maybe I won't need you today, maybe I won't need you tomorrow, but someday. Oh, I don't really, uh, I think I'm good. Right. Oh. But still, you got the coin, I got the goods. I draw my phone in the toilet and this is a backup until I can get it replaced under warranty. <laughs> Everyone murmurs their sympathies, we've all been there. We go back to playing. I really gotta stop eating these pigs in blankets. Pigs in a blanket? Pig in pigs in a blankets? I don't know, but they're very good. I think there might be cheese in them. Mm. Oh, I don't know if I got enough to raise you on this round. You can always bet your firstborn. Oh. <laughs> if you think you can handle another one, be my guest. Briar and Hazel are a handful, to say the least. Buddy, you think three kids is a handful? Try four. I'm operating at 100% dad capacity nice. at all times. Actually, it's technically oh. five. Christine saw a commercial for one of those dolls that poop and wouldn't stop asking for it. We ended up getting it for her, <laughs> getting it for her for her birthday, but she's so grossed out by the fake baby poop that she makes me change its diaper. So now I'm changing the real baby and the fake baby. Yeah. There's just a lot of poop in my household right now. <laughs> Daisy got one of those a while back. One night I walk in on her after she had tried to take the doll apart to see how the poop mechanism worked, but then she couldn't put it back together and started crying. Poop everywhere. Fake poop, but still. <laughs> That reminds me of- wait, do we all have poop doll stories? Everyone nods in agreement. Guys, I really don't need any more poop in my life than there already is. Can we just get back to poker and not talk about poop? <laughs> Matt deals another hand and we quickly forget about the poop. We run out of pigs in a blanket, so we switch over to Craig's healthy snack food. It actually isn't terrible. These kale chips are phenomenal. We should sell these at the coffee shop. It's my own recipe. I'd be happy to give it to you guys. I can see it now. Pierce the kale chips. <laughs> Yeah, Pier Pierce the Veil is a popular post-hardcore screamo band out of San Diego. We all look at Matt confused. It's, uh, it's maybe not any of your wheelhouses. <laughs> How's the shop nowadays? Busy as ever. I'm toying with the idea of hiring on another person to work the counter, but I haven't found a good candidate. Hmm. If Amanda's looking for a summer gig, let me know. That's really nice of you, but I think she's been burned out too badly by coffee shops before. Like, literally, not figuratively. Matt cocks his head to the side. I'll ask her, though. <laughs> we get down to the final hand of the night, and it's Craig in the lead by a landslide. Joseph has long since lost all of his chips, and has taken to tidying up, refusing any help from the rest of us. Brian deals with all cards. So, what's it gonna be for Robert to give a damn on this round? Robert looks up from his half-empty glass of whiskey. You really wanna unleash the beast? Well, now I'm curious. I got a long history of being a gambling man, but I'll only do it if you make it interesting. None of this penny chip nonsense. I got Lily's 18-year single blend sitting in my closet right now. Was saving it for when River turns 21, but I'm willing to put it up as collateral. Ah. Now you're talking my language. He throws the keys to his truck on the table. She's seen better days, but you could still put a, pull a tree trunk out of the ground. Nope. <laughs> Myself and everyone else at the table immediately folds. Feel the cards, bry guy. Are you guys sure you wanna... You heard the man. Deal. <laughs> Brian deals the next round of cards. Craig stares daggers at Robert, who casually sips his whiskey. So I know what you might be thinking. Robert pulls the old workhorse up for grabs, his only mode of transportation. At times, his life is only home. How could he be so sure of his abilities in gambling? I'll tell you right now, Craig. I wasn't always like this. I was a lot like you. Smart, talented, cocksure of my own luck, great biceps. But it didn't last long, though. I lost everything in a game of Pi Gow in the back room of a Shenzhen tea house and what I thought was a three-day business trip. Everything gone. Clothes, money, identification, you name it. I woke up in a ditch near Jiawei Park and I had to make my new life from there. It took me three years to beg, <laughs> beg, borrow, and steal my way back to American soil. And in those three years, I saw the greatest depths of human fear, love deeper than I ever had, and lost it all many times over. I've seen my own death, Craig. I know how I die, it's not like this. So let's make this more interesting. Robert produces a deed to his house from his jacket and tosses it on the table. All I have and all I am. Are you prepared to go the distance? Craig wipes his sweat from his brow. He studies Robert's face intently, searching for any sort of tell that he can find. Robert casually sips his whiskey again. I... I... Bold. Everyone erupts. Fine, fine. The whiskey is yours. That's why you don't dance with the devil. So what was it? Were you bluffing or did he have the cards? That's for me to take to my grave, fellas. Next week, boys? Next week. You got it. I'll be there.
Sure. This has been very relaxing, and I sincerely doubt I will wake up in a cold sweat thinking about it tonight. Keep working on that poker face, Bogan. We all say our goodbyes and head our separate ways. Always use a coat of wax after a wash. Oh, that reminds me, I have to put some finish on the walking stick I'm working on. Okay, Joseph. Last one to get to. Six string. <laughs> His wife. It's a good book. Aww. I want him to get back to the sea. A bird in the hand is better than a bird in the eye. Drink plenty of water. Which reminds me, I should drink some water. Well, it's ice sun tea, but... His family's a little weird, but Joseph seems cool. I should take him up on his offer to hang out. Wait. How do I hang out with a priest? I don't go to church. Should I be Jesus-y? I imagine Joseph's family staring at me as I fumble through some sort of prayer attempt. Maybe not too Jesus-y. A light smattering of Jesus. Will he want me to pray? Is he gonna pray at me? Do I have to pray at him? Talking to Joseph, huh? Yeah. Amanda, how, how many times have I told you not to sneak up on me like that? I selectively ignore it every time you do, Pops. Amanda looks over my shoulder at the screen. Joseph can't read your mind, you know. If you want to talk, just message him. I've never been friends with a priest before. He's a youth minister, isn't that different? What do I talk about? My favorite Bible passage? Ice cream socials? Khakis? <laughs> First of all, he's a youth minister with a tattoo, not a priest. There's a difference? Dad. You're overthinking it, Dad. Listen, just put it like this. Hello, neighbor! Thanks again for the invite to the barbecue. I'd love to hang out soon if you're not too busy. Is that a little too business casual? Hmm. Fine, fine. Give me the keyboard. I got this. Amanda focuses on the keys. Hi, Joseph. It was great meeting you and your family. I'm still new around here, so if you'd like to, I'd love to hang out and get to know you. See ya! The smiley face is a nice touch. Almost immediately, I receive a response. What do you say? Hi, Brogan! If you're not doing anything in a bit, the kids and I are baking treats for the church bake sale today, and we'd love to have you over. It'll be a blast, so let me know. Joseph. Huh, that wasn't so bad. He uses a lot of exclamation points. I'm more concerned about him signing his name with a tilde. <laughs> tilde. I'm, I'm willing to let it slide this time. I respond back. Sounds like fun, Brogan. Well, I guess I'm doing this. Save a brownie for me. Promise you won't sneak up on me anymore. Amanda stares at me, unblinking. I don't make promises I can't keep. Real to a fall, Pops. Dad. And Dad, please don't be weird about the religion thing. Me, weird. Never. I make the short walk over to Joseph's place. Don't be weird, Brogan. I love the anchor. But what if they hang up a bunch of crosses or collect those little porcelain babies? What if they're all praying? Did they pray before dinner? During dinner? Over the porcelain babies? The door begins to creak open. A shadowy figure obscured on the other side. Who's there? Uh, Brogan? The door opens the rest of the way. It's Joseph's eldest. What's his name? Hey. Hey, uh... Chris? Hi again! It's... Uh, I'm Brogan. I know what your name is. Oh, yeah, we met at the barbecue. How was the, uh... Please don't say it. Jesus? <laughs> Chris blinks slowly. Maybe you didn't hear that. You're weird. Is your dad- Before I finish, Chris walks into an adjacent room, leaving me in front of the open doorway. Home? This is a great first impression. For a moment I wonder if I should just go in, further subjecting Joseph's family to my winning attitude and artful charisma. Mercifully, Joseph- Mercifully, Joseph peeks his head around the corner. Brogan, you made it. Joseph approaches with his arms wide. I'm so glad you could come by. Are you ready to bake? I am not. I'm as ready as I'll ever be. <laughs> That's the kind of semi-confidence I like to see in a baking assistant. Come on in! Oh. Joseph leads me into a bright, spacious home full of nautical knickknacks. This isn't what I imagined at all. It's actually pretty charming. It's fat. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, the boat. I have a miniature version of one of these boat shelves. Yes. I love nautical stuff. Mm -hmm. I believe you meant Chris, who left you outside. Yeah. Chris. Hmm. Are you going to apologize? Oh, right. Sorry. I try to make eye contact with Chris, but he keeps looking away. He must be really shy. It's alright. Next time, just be a little more inviting to our guests, okay? Sure. 
Chris seems to relish a chance to escape the conversation and quickly vanishes into his room. Joseph turns to me apologetically. I'll take it personally. Chris, li Chris likes to keep to himself. I mean, we didn't start off on the best foot in the world. Plus, being the eldest in a big family can't be easy. We try to cut him a little slack when we can. Ah, and here are the twins, Christian and Christy. Say hello to Brogan. Hello, Father. Hello, Brogan. Kids, come on. Dial it back on the creepy twin stick. Creepy twin stick. Egg them on. Can you two say, come play with us, Danny? Oh, no. The twins stare up in unblinking unison. Come play with us, Danny. Joseph covers his mouth and looks away, but he's clearly holding back a big laugh. This is it. This is my dad world series. Okay, now say, please help us, Mothra. <laughs> please help us, Mothra. <laughs> no, I can't take it. Joseph is trying his best not to break in front of his kids. The twins seem to be catching on and look eager to bust their dad. But can't we keep it up? Go with something creepy. Now say, they all float down here. They all float down here, father. <laughs> Joseph can't take it anymore. Despite his quiet protestations, he's laughing pretty hard into his hand, and the kids giggle with him. The twins, obviously pleased with the new arsenal of spooky weapons, leave the room to terrorize the rest of the community. My work here is done. I wonder what the obscure choice would have been. I'm going to be hearing those lines for weeks. Next time we hang out, I'll try to teach them some lines from the thing. All right, so it looks like we've got a bit of a troublemaker on our hands. You think we can out trouble? You think you can out trouble the career pro? I don't know about that. I'm suddenly interrupted by a loud crash from the kitchen. What now? That doesn't sound good, Christy. No one responds. Joseph furrows his brow and motions me to stay where I am. Wait here a moment. And Joseph runs into the kitchen. I remembered this with Amanda. Half of fatherhood is trying to keep your kids from finding creative ways to kill themselves, and he's got four. Talk about worry. I take a seat on a surprisingly pristine couch and twiddle my thumbs. Examine bookshelf, coffee table, floor. See what's on there. There's a couple cool knickknacks on the coffee table in front of me. Hey, a cross. Hey, another cross. This one looks a little different. And a third cross. Unified design aesthetic, smart choices. There's also a brass thing here. It looks like something a sailor would use to navigate with. I think they're called sextants? Heh, <laughs> sex. Bookshelf? It's a pretty sturdy wooden bookshelf. It looks handmade. Did Joseph build this? There's a big stack of what looks like travel magazines, hyenas of the Serengeti, the underwater mysteries of the Antarctic, and on and on. Seems like Joseph really loves a good adventure. Unless this is a merry thing, who knows? Next to them are a couple of different Bibles. Looks like he's covering all the Bible bases. King James, New American Standard, the Bible for teens. He is a cool youth minister, after all. On a higher shelf, there are a bunch of old romance novels. Judging by the wine stains, these must be Mary's. The newest one looks like Hot Body Johnson Sex Detective. The eighth installment in... Wait, this is a series? Examine floor. Well, you have this many kids, and things are bound to end up on the floor, no matter how, you tried to keep it, how hard you tried to keep it clean. I spot a terrifying cloth doll that appears to have had both arms pulled off several times. It's been stitched back together a lot. The tag says C plus C, of course. I set that down and spot a houseplant. Hey, little guy. Keep being you, tiny houseplant. I spot one last thing on the floor next to the houseplant. It's a silver necklace. Wow, this looks expensive for something casually tossed on the floor. There's a story here. It's none of my business. It's been a while. I guess I should go in the kitchen and see what's up. <laughs> I walk into the kitchen to find Joseph holding Christy on one arm. She seems a lot a lot calmer than she was a minute ago. I raise an eyebrow at Joseph. <laughs> the twins are a lot more manageable when they're separated. Where's Christian? He ran off. Jo Christy dips a spoon into the brownie batter and gives it a taste. Dad, it's too sweet. <laughs> You're too sweet. No, I'm not. You're so sweet, we might have to water you down with spiders. No, not spiders! Joseph begins tickling Christy with his free hand, between the laughing and squirming, I don't know how he's got a hold of her, but that girl is locked in place. This man is a professional child wrangler. Christy flexes, fixes me with her best puppy dog eyes. Save me from the spiders! Spoon duel the spider queen! Renegade option! What? Well, I... I don't know. I grab a wooden spoon and point it in Joseph's direction. Unhound her, foul beast. Okay, Brogan the Valiant, let's see what you got. You may have defeated me at Tarantula Ridge, but now I have the upper hand. Joseph gently puts Christy down behind him. Have you come to squash me tonight, or have you merely fallen into my web? 
I'm no mere fly spider king, now on guard. For a minute or so, Joseph and I mock duel with the two dumbest looking spoons in the room. Eventually, I strike a killing blow in the invisible heart between his arms and his body, and Joseph recoils in horror. Blast, I am defeated. You could never best me, spider king, for I have the power of... I sneak a taste from the brownie batter. The magic. Oh man. That is way too sweet. <laughs> Christy begins jumping up and down excitedly. My hero! Christy hugs my leg before making a surprisingly fast exit. Hey, wait, do you want to bake brownies with us? Christy hesitates and shakes her head no again. Sparkle Pony. Sparkle Pony? Joseph looks confused. You don't want to bake with Dad now? Do you want to play, you want to play with Sparkle Pony? Yes. Okay. Go. Before Joseph can even finish his sentence, Christy is out of the door and down the hall. Ahead. Joseph sighs deeply as he stares into the chocolate batter. He tastes it again, face twisting. And that is still way too sweet. So, what made that crash? Egg beaters on linoleum floor. It's my new techno single. Still haven't thought of a B-side. Now we're both looking into the batter. It's got a sickly sheen of sugar and chocolate candies throughout, and I have a feeling Christy has something to do with it. We need a fresh start. Oh, uh, yeah. Like I said, I'm not really a baker, but... Yes. Tone even sweated. The bag came with instructions that have mysteriously vanished along with my daughter, so we'll probably be fine. Probably. Yeah, probably. He certainly looks confident. All right, Brogan, you baked a cake from a box before. Once. How hard could this be? Now grab a spoon and get ready to rock. Hmm? Is this gonna be a minigame? Let me put my iced tea down. Hold on. Mario Batali, save me. Joseph and I get to work, cracking the eggs and mixing things, and then pouring the things according to how we assume the backs of the box would tell us to. Things go according to plan, and soon we have a solid batch of brownies. Okay, not a mini game. Okay. Huh. Wait. Joseph has a little dotted batter on his nose. Wow, Brogan, way to use those dad skills. I bet you baked a few box mixes in your time. His nose. Joseph. All we have to do is bring these to the bake sale, and voila, duty done. Hmm. <clears throat> Now help me find Christy. Keep your eye out for a pony that sparkles. Joseph holds still. What? Thumb in position. And got it. Joseph's eyes go wide as they gently wipe the chocolate off his nose. Is he blushing? Oh, uh, thanks. No problem. In less than a second, I blick the batter off my finger. It's really good batter. Well, uh... We should find Christy. Yes, yes, we should. Do that, Brogan. Joseph quickly composes himself. All right, she can't be far. You take the delta position and I'll watch her six. Do you even know what that means? Alpha Tango Sparkle, roger roger. <laughs> Joseph starts making his way down the hall and calls back to me. Take the brownies and the rest of the stuff I baked earlier today while I get Christy. We'll meet you all by the car. <laughs> Joseph, Christy, and I arrive at the church parking lot to find fold-out tables and pop-up tents already set up. Looks like the bake sale is already in full swing. <laughs> wow, this place is packed. Is this? Packed? There are a few people milling around. Must be a value oh. pack. If you can count a city's population on your fingers and toes, this counts as packed. Point. Christy rockets out of the car and into the lot. Is she running on jet fuel? I want to sell brownies! Okay, okay, let's get set up. I want to see Mom! She's down by the other row of tables, helping out with another group. Want to go over there and tell her I said hi? Mom! Christy zips off immediately. Joseph seems unconcerned. Does she always run that fast? Yeah, and I can only catch her half the time. These knees aren't what they used to be. I remember when Amanda was her age. I couldn't get her to sit still for five seconds. Yep, great age to deal with. Hey. While Christy's gone, Joseph and I arrange all of our baked goods on the table and settle in. Uh, so, are we allowed to eat any of our own goods? Look, if I don't see nothing, I don't say nothing. The man upstairs has strong feelings about snitches. Th does he actually? Joseph shrugs. He eats a brownie. It looks like some of the other stalls are selling drinks, little handmade crafts, and other sweets. Whoa, someone brought a soft serve ice cream machine. I gestured to it. How are we supposed to compete with that? Please, this is my first time to the rodeo. The bake sale rodeo. Uh -huh. There's actually no rodeo here, it's just a bake sale. <laughs> I think you and I put I think you and I put together can make one pretty convincing argument for these brownies, don't you? Oh yeah, I hope so. Sneak another brownie to ease your field public interaction. Oh yeah. We high five. If you bake it, they will come. It's not long before we have our first customers. Hey, Coffee family. My, hey, dude. Hiya! Matt, Carmencita, great to see you guys out here. 
Happy to support a good cause. Plus, he knows the owner and proprietor of the Coffee Spoon, an establishment that specializes in baked goods. I have to scope out the competition. Joseph leans oh. close to me. This guy knows the stuff. Stay on your toes. So, what recipe did you use for these brownies? Don't say you use the box recipe. Don't say you use the box recipe. We improvised. I just let the baking spirit move through me, you know? A little bit of flour here, a pinch of salt there. It's sort of like interpretive dance, but with cooking. Interpretive cooking, yes. You can never make the same thing twice. Every batch is special. There will never be another batch of brownies with the exact flavor sensation that these right here have. It's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, Matt. All right, all right, we'll take two. Actually, we'll take three. I ring them up and high-five Joseph as our happy customers walk away. See, not so hard. Yeah, I'm hot off the goods. I got up the good feelings from the last sale. Who's next? We sell brownies to a bunch of people I don't recognize, but who clearly know Joseph. Eventually, other fami another familiar face pops up. Brogan! It's Brian! Oh. Close enough. Huh. Can we interest you, can it interest you two in any of our fine sweets and treats? Uh. You sure can! I bet I could eat ten brownies. Must resist urge to be competitive. I bet I could eat eleven brownies. <laughs> Let the man buy his brownies. So, we'll put you down for ten? Ha! Better make it just two. One for me and one for Daisy. Oh man, maybe I should have been competitive to get him to buy more. Ah, damn it, I... <laughs> Coming right up. You excited for youth group movie night, Daisy? Yeah, what's the movie? It's a surprise. Joseph leans over to me. It's the Fast and the Furious. Really? If you think about it, there's some heavy religious undertones. Joseph hands a baggie to Daisy. I made sure to give you guys the edges. Clearly superior part of the brownie topography. Thanks, Joseph. Our two customers walk off with their purchases. Joseph and I survey our stock. These are selling pretty hot. At this rate, we'll have enough money to pay for a new paint job on the church pews in no time. Wait, what happened to the pews? Ernest Bray painted his rapper alias onto them. <laughs> young Steinbeck. I would have gone for a young man in the sea, but I can respect that. Speaking in ministerial terms, Ernest is hard to reach. In father terms, Ernest is kind of a turd. Being a cool youth minister seems like a lot of work. It is, but it's worth it. Although, sometimes I wish... Ah, never mind. Ah, uh, what? It's kind of silly, but... Do you ever wish you could just drop everything and go lounge around on a beach somewhere in the tropics, drink fruity blended beverages, fall asleep on a hammock, you know, basically live out a Jimmy Buffett song? Joseph, I think about this every single day of my life. My dream is to live in Margaritaville. One day, my friend, one day we'll be on an island time. We make a couple more sales to some more church patrons. Everything seems to be going smooth. Everything seems to be going smoothly. Off in the distance, I spot my old buddy Craig. Craig, it's gonna be a hard sell. Craig's a fitness man. I think he comes to these bake sales to test himself to see if he has the resolve to refuse processed mm -hmm. sugar. Are you sure you're ready for this? We go way back. I got this. Craig jogs up to our table with Briar and Hazel in tow. They're each finishing an ice cream cone, so it's unlikely we're going to sell them on brownies, too. Probably won't be able to sell to the baby. She's impossible to read. It all comes down to Craig. Hey, bros. Hi, Uncle Joseph. Hi, Amanda's dad. <laughs> Would you be interested in one of our delicious homemade brownies? Hmm, I don't know. Remember that one time? You can't spell diet without da. <laughs> Tempt him. Should I go with the nostalgia? Let's, I don't know, let's go with nostalgia. Hey, Craig, when we were freshmen, remember how our next-door neighbors pranked us by switching out our laundry detergent with dish soap and how the washing machine exploded with suds, and we decided to get back to them by baking brownies for them but sprinkling high-intensity hot sauce into the mix and we watched them cry after oh. eating it? Ha! <laughs> that would feel bad, but we actually had to, clean up, we had to clean up the laundry room ourselves. Anyway, these brownies are like that, but without the hot sauce. Maybe you should get one more for old time's sake. Oh. Craig thinks for a second. All the girls just want a game. You know what? We'll take one for each of us. Even a river? I'll eat hers. You've got yourselves a deal. The day winds down. We're pretty much out of items to sell. Everyone starts packing up. Christy eventually comes back and immediately falls asleep in Joseph's folding chair. Box mix, huh? Mary Saunders up to us. She looks like she'd rather be anywhere else in here. Oh, hi, honey. Yep, they're selling like hotcakes. Which is, actually, they're just brownies. Cute. <laughs> And a boring and safe. Um, hey Mary. Mary's eyes dart over to me. What's a rookie doing here? I was just hoping to introduce Brogan to the rest of the community. Uh-huh. You get all over this freak show. What? Hey. Weird folk is all holier than thou types. Hey. Don't you think, Brogan? Mary, let the kid answer the question. 
Uh, kid, <laughs> kind of weird. They seem nice. Shepard Brownie and Melissa Canton. They seem nice. They, uh, they all seem like they're really excited to help out the church. That's pretty cool, I guess. Huh. <laughs> Perry, can we talk about this later? Come on. Oh, am I embarrassing you in front of your new friend? Joseph doesn't respond, trying his hardest to keep his cool. Can we please talk about this later? Oh, sure thing, honey bear. Get divorced already. Mm. Mary turns her attention to me. And over the cash. Uh, mm. Jesus, I'm not trying to rob you. I'm in charge of the funds here. I hand over the cash we've made. It feels like a hefty wad, if I may say so myself. Mm. Thanks. Yeah. Now, give me your wallet. What? Yeah. Give me your wallet. You think this church is going to fix yourself? Mm. Fix itself? Mary, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Sorry, I'll work on the whole pretending to be happy thing. Mary leans in and whispers to me. He's really good at it. Mary walks off without saying goodbye. Yeesh. Yeesh. Um, I'm really sorry about that. You okay? She really likes pushing your buttons, huh? Joseph shrugs. No, marriage is perfect. Is that you shouldn't even be in a marriage. Get divorced. Just break it off. It, you don't need it. You, you ready to head out? Joseph and I to load the folding tables back into my car. Christy nods off the moment Joseph straps her into the car seat. I drop Joseph off in front of his house. A small yawn sneaks out of me. Looks like I tuckered you out, huh? I'm a sleepy dad. I think I might be finally crashing from all the sugar. <laughs> I won't keep you up then. Thanks for helping me out today. Happy to do it. Also happy to eat brownies. Well, now I want some brownies. Well, next time I promise we'll do something a bit more exciting and a bit less free labor. And I'm very sorry about the whole thing with Mary. Shouldn't have had to see that. It's fine, really. I know, but first hang out domestic problems aren't a good look. You barely know me. Mm. Let me make it up to you next time. It won't be Margaritaville. We'll do something fun, promise. I smile. I'd like yeah. that. Oh, and one last thing. Joseph tosses a cling-wrapped brownie through the window. It hits me in the face when I'm oh. able to catch it. It's the last one. You earned it. Joseph, please don't leave me alone with this brownie. <laughs> nope, too late. I'm already walking away. But, <laughs> bye! <laughs> Joseph walks up to his home. He waves at me before carrying Christy inside. Well, looks like it's just you and me, brownie. See, what if, how, what if I give the brownie to Amanda? I pocket the brownie. This might come in handy down the road. Ah. I step inside to find Amanda doing homework oh. on the couch. Hey, father unit. Hi, child that I'm required by law to care for. How's homework? It's really fun and educational. Really? How long have you known me for? <laughs> right. Mm. How was the bake sale? Good. I think I really could have made a good life for myself as a brownie salesman. Glad to hear it. So? Mm. So what? Were there any extra brownies? Or did he maybe sneak one? Or I think for a moment realized that I still have the brownie that Joseph gave me. This would probably do better in someone else's stomach than mine. Yeah. Whoa. Heads up. Wait. I hurl the brownie towards Amanda. It hits the wall behind her and falls on the ground. Nice throw. She scoops it up and smiles at me. Thanks, Pops. Hey, if you're not going to bed anytime soon, would you get, be game for some real shark hunters of Orange County? I thought the last hunter got eaten by a shark. Mm -hmm. He did. I sit down next to her and cozy up with a blanket. Awesome. Hmm. Okay, so I think I have to go on multiple dates with him. Grill, Dad Snark, Kickflip, Youth Brownie, Mary. Can I convince them to... Uh, can I convince them to get a divorce for their own good? Welcome. You've got dads. Hello, Amanda's dad. <laughs> it's me, your friend Craig, who loves sports. I have nice and smart children who are good at computers. Ah, oh, man, great to hear from you, buddy. I think that's one of his kids. What's up? I'm still strong. <laughs> strong. I, I am M strong. Ha, ah, don't I know it. Say, I've been ringing up about whey protein. You use that at all? I figured it'd help me develop a bit more muscle. Yes, I know what that is. <laughs> My children are having a tea party and they wanted to invite Amanda, but we can't find her on here. You're also invited. Physical invitation to follow. Cool, I'd love to come. I'll let Amanda know. Thank you, Amanda's dad. <laughs> Have you ever read Rich Dad, Poor Dad? It's a fucking garbage book. I've definitely read Rich Dad, Poor Dad overrated. Coffee time. You know dads love coffee. Gonna brew myself something black as midnight on a moonless night. I put on a fresh pot and work on a few word jumbles while I wait for it to brew. Hey, this one spells sorrow. <laughs> Dad, ready for today? I'm ready for every day, sweetie. Gonna tackle it head on. No, are you ready for the thing that we're gonna go to do today? The thing that you promised you'd do? Honey, I already told you that I'm not gonna throw away my Tom Clancy novels. 
They're just stacked in living room. I keep bumping into them and knocking them over and you don't even read them. Wait, no, that's not even what I'm here about. The tea party, Dad! Uh, nope, I don't remember that. Craig's kids, that hand-drawn invitation. Amanda walks over to the refrigerator and comes back with a hand-drawn invitation on a sheet of computer paper, inviting, inviting Amanda and Amanda's dad to a tea party. They spelled cordially wrong. Just put on some going outside pants and let's get going. I can go outside in sweatpants, nothing's stopping me. Dad, just, oh, I'll see you in a minute. Fuck authority. <laughs> No, you know what? Let's let, it's a tea party. We should dress up. Let's put on some going outside pants. Hello, thank you for coming to our tea party. I do my best to bow and present my daughter, who thanks them with a curtsy. This way, please. Brian and Hazel lead us to a small table with tiny chairs. Some are occupied by stuffed animals, and Matt and his daughter Carmencita are here too. Matt raises a comically small plastic teacup at me. Hey, dude. <laughs> How's the tea? The imaginary tea is absolutely wonderful. I taste a hint of lemongrass. Hello, Carmencita. Hello, Mr. Amanda's dad. Please, have a seat. I sit down between Amanda and Matt. I don't think I'm going to be able to get out of this chair. Hi, everyone. I turn to see Daisy and Brian enter the backyard and take a seat next to us. Sorry we're late. Daisy may be put on going outside pants. See, Amanda? Amanda gives me a knowing look, and I return an obliging wink. She rolls her eyes. Is that really something your daughter had to pressure you into, Brian? I give Amanda another, even more exaggerated wink. She rolls her eyes even harder. Thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules for some high tea. Actually, it's a common misconception that high tea was appreciated by noble. Dad, shut up! Now, if you'll all put on your designated tiaras, there are little tiaras sitting in everyone's plates. Well, except for Brian's. His is a softball helmet. Oh! Uh, we ran out of tiaras. I don't think this is gonna fit me, but I appreciate the thought. Dad, you're royalty. Please act like it. Oh. Brian tries to balance the ill-fitting softball helmet on top of his head, but he immediately tumbles off and into the bushes. I'll get that later. Hey, everybody! Craig comes out with a teapot and a tray of sandwich cookies. Dad, is the tea ready? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, it's been, um, steeping for a while now. Awesome! What do you girls like to serve your guest tea? No, thank you. We'd very much appreciate our servant's help. Craig leans over to me. That's me. Craig places teacups in front of all of us and a single sandwich cookie onto each of our plates. He pours some tea into my cup. Hmm, awfully fluorescent for tea. I drink my teacup and Matt, ta Matt takes a sip. Go lemonade. It's tea. Right, very good tea. I lean over to Amanda, who's happily enjoying her tea. Uh, so, what do we do at tea parties? We enjoy the splendors of upper-class society, Father. She takes a dainty bite of her sandwich cookie. Marvelous. So, the meeting of princesses has been called to order. Here, here. But I'm a warrior princess. I hunt and stuff, and I have, like, a really cool sword. Can I be a space princess? I'll allow it. And I'll be a rock star princess. I'm also a space princess. Can there be more than one? Space is pretty big, don't you think? I changed my mind. I want to be a space princess, too. <laughs> Dad, what are you? Do I get to be a princess? Duh. Well, I guess that makes me... History Channel princess, hacker princess, rude boy princess, scoff for life. I'll, I drop, if I drop my crown on the floor, I'll make sure to pick it up. Pick it up, pick it up. <laughs> oh my god, pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. Nice. I think I'll be the landscaper and general contracting princess. Barista princess, reporting for duty. Hey everyone, CrossFit Princess here. Not now, servant. If it weren't for the princess uprising, it would be you serving me. We sip tea for a little longer, and then the girls run off to fight dinosaurs as space rock, as space rock star warrior princesses, I think. They grow up so fast. It was like yesterday that I was helping Amanda throw her own tea parties. Did she make you a servant too? You betcha. Carmen Sita made me actually brew tea for hers. Pitfalls owning a coffee shop. Pitfall, your custom blends are amazing. The hibiscus one you gave me a while back was choice. Aw, thanks. Really nice the girls are getting along. Yeah, I'm really glad we moved into this community. We are too. Amanda's been kind of a role model of them, you know? I hadn't even realized, and I don't even know if Amanda does either, but I guess they're right. All of these girls in the neighborhood look up to her. She seems to go out of her way to play with them. I'm so proud of her. You better not proud dad cry at this tea party, Brogan. I, I brought extra word jumbles if anyone wants to kill some time while the girls play. 
The day rolls on and the girls all get tuckered out. Amanda spends the whole day playing with them and taking their pictures, promising that she'll send them the best ones later. We all clean up and help put away the tea sets and tables and help out as Daisy and Carmen see to fall asleep on their dad's shoulders. Oh. Take care, guys. Thanks for coming! Bye, rude boy princess. Hmm. You want dinner? Nah, I filled up on cookies. Me too, I'm tired. Hmm. Dude, same! Playing with a bunch of little kids while simultaneously want your attention and approval is surprisingly exhausting. But in a good way, but also in kind of a scary way. Also, I feel like I gotta be on my best behavior for them. I don't want to let them down. Is that because you still feel bad about dropping the F-bomb in front of your cousin that one time? I corrupted her dad, she's secondhand smokes now. <laughs> well, those kids really look up to you. I'm glad they have you as a role, mo role model. Shucks, Pops. I ruffle Amanda's hair. Aw. Please remember to call us once in a while. Welcome. You've got dads. Ugh. Alright, I'm just gonna go through them in order again. More coffee, more music. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if the police are driving behind you, don't give them probable cause to pull you over. <laughs> Instead of messaging the guy, why don't I just walk over and grab some coffee? I'm feeling really sluggish today, anyway. Man, now I want some, like, coffee and brownies. I want some coffee and brownies and cookies. Huh. I want to dunk the co- I want to dunk the brownie in the coffee. And the tea. Amanda sticks her head about her broom. Father! Wanna go to the coffee spoon? Oh, so you get so-called cool- cool once, and now you're the cool dad who hangs out at coffee shops and listens to neo jazz and stuff. Amanda. Are you going to bring your laptop and your leather-bound journal so you can work on your poetry anthology? Look, honey, do you want me to buy you coffee or not? Hmm? Let me grab my laptop and my leather-bound journal. <laughs> Amanda and I take the short walk over to the coffee spoon. The place is quiet today, just a few people hanging out and reading books in the cozy little nooks. I walk up to the counter and see a familiar, pierced face. I- this guy's so- look at him. Pablo, hey, you're the dude I yelled at a bunch the other night. Aww. Amanda casts a sideways glance at me. He tried to sell me shirts. And who might you be, miss? Aww. This is my daughter, Amanda, the person I am a father to and am very protective of. An honor to make your acquaintance. My name is Pablo. Did I mention that I make witch house music? Mm. I wouldn't call it witch house music, but okay. Uh. A piercing blow to my ego, though not one that will dissuade my need to impress you. <laughs> my innate dad senses tingle. I am overwhelmed with a fatherly protective energy. I must do something to protect my child. Change the subject. Defend witch house. <laughs> Reappropriate lines from Taken. Um. Anyways, Pablo, I didn't know you worked here. Uh, yeah, man. Today's my first day. Matt's still training me. Broken. Matt comes out from the washing dishes in the back room to meet Amanda and I. He and I high five, as fellow cool people do. I see you met my newest employee. At your service. Although I'm only here until Bacon Vale starts their world tour. When's that? Well, uh, we have to put out a record first. <laughs> Alright, Pablo, now what do we do with customers again? Right, yes. Pablo clears his throat. Hello, good folk of Maple Bay. Can I interest you in a tasty, ca tasty caffeinated beverage? A smashing pumpkin spice latte, please. A classic, and you? Americana football, decaf for cutie, Father John Misto. Uh, let's do an Americano. Americana football, please. Our coffee is as strong as that band's feelings. Good choice. I don't get it. <laughs> oh, uh, American football is a sport, but also this emo band that made a good album and then waited over a decade and made another good album. And their music was very sad and sometimes featured sad trumpets. And I'm over explaining the joke again. Coming right up. <laughs> Pablo gets to work making our drinks while Matt observes him. He'll get the hang of it, for as goofy, of a do goofy as a dude as he is, kid works hard. Hey, man, that concert was a lot of fun. We should hang out again. Hell yes. I'm actually going to be done training Pablo in a couple hours and was going to go record shopping. Want to come along? Absolutely. Hey. Pablo brings us our drinks and Amanda buries herself in her laptop. I spend my time sipping my drink and cracking jokes with Matt. Last time we hung out, he told me he had trouble hanging out with other people, but for some reason he and I can talk and joke like old buds. It's weird, I feel really comfortable around him. Probably because he's a cool, chill barista. Once Matt feels comfortable leaving Pablo on his own, I say goodbye to Amanda and we start walking to the record store. You ever been here before? 
No, I mean, well, we have a record player sitting in the living room, but all I have are two copies of Frampton Comes Alive. Oh, this should be fun, then. We're gonna find you some good stuff. Hook me up with that good stuff, music man. The walls of the store are packed with posters, artwork, stickers, and records. A few people mill around, flipping through milk crates of albums. Some indie band is playing through the speakers. It's a nice vibe. I'm not into vinyl records. Well, like, I have a vinyl player, but I never use it. <laughs> but I do love record shops. They're just so nice. So, why do people still buy records? Isn't it kind of outdated at this point? There's a lot of people who would try to tell you that vinyl sounds warmer or more true to the artist's intent, but really I think it's just nice to collect records. It's cool that in this day and age we have just about every song ever created available instantaneously on our phones, but there's something about holding an album and getting to see the artwork in your hands that I'll always love. That's beautiful. That's why I try to get as many of the records that I love in physical forms as possible. Remember when we were kids and we would have to wait around by the radio with the cassette tapes we would record our favorite songs? Oh, fucking nostalgia bomb right there. It made each listen really special. Like, oh man, you'd have to... You'd wait for the radio announcer to be like, oh, next we're gonna play so-and-so, and you'd, you'd wait with your finger on that record button until it was about to go. Until you either heard the first the first note of the song or you played it a second too early and got the tail end of the last song oh man a anyway it made each listen really special and mixtapes were even cooler because of how much work they took now you just make a playlist i think the last time someone gave me a real mixtape was in high school hey. i look around the multi-level record store and spot some genres future wave jungle or an anarcho punk nunsploitation <laughs> isn't that a horror genre i have no idea where to even start Man, this is a little overwhelming. Here, let me help you find something you might like. If you were a milkshake, what flavor would it be? Mint! Oh, it's not here. Cookies and cream, vanilla, purple. I really like purple, but cookies and cream is my favorite of these. If you could only buy one type of candle scent for the rest of your life, what would it be? Daffodil Mountain Spring, Camouflage Summer Breeze, Spring Creek Fireball, Power Violence Cherry Blossom. I'm really into these two. Spring Creek Fireball sounds great, but Power Violence Cherry Blossom also sounds great. I'm gonna have to go with Spring Creek Fireball. What's your favorite ambient sound? Rain, Bowling Alley, Star Trek Bridge Ambiance, Hell of the Bones Chorus, Hell of the Bone Chorus. Never heard of that. Rain is a good classic. I haven't even thought of. Oh, that's a really good- okay, well, and this is a really hard choice. I think I gotta go bowling alley. What's your dream vacation spot? My backyard, inside an active volcano, living off the fat of the land in Ibiza. Starting a new life in the Baltics. Uh... Ibiza is a tropical place, right? What's your deepest, darkest fear? I worry that people are nice to me only because they want something from me. I fear that I don't deserve happiness and won't ever get it. What if nobody exists but me and I fabricated the universe saying you too and the waiter tells you to enjoy your food? Um, None of these are the deepest depths of the ocean, so... This one's close. Matt thinks for a moment. Hmm. What? Oh, I know just the thing. Man runs over to the other end of the store and returns, holding a record behind his back. He shows it to me. This is Trouble Will Find Me by The National. Hey, I like The National. Cool. The National have honed their sad guy sound on album after album, and by this point, their old po old po pro is about feeling blue. The music is so amazing that it'll actually cheer you up. Whoa, dude, thanks for the recommendation. You're gonna have a great time with it, promise. Oh, uh, hey, Cheska. I am playing Dream Daddy, and now I have to check out this song, because I only have one album by The National, and the only reason I know about them is because they did, uh, they did that song for Portal 2 called Exile of Vilify, which, uh, plays a sort of an easter egg in that one room. Um, but now I gotta check out, uh, some of their other music, because I might like more of it. Yep. <laughs> Hope you're doing good today. I, I love this game. The art is beautiful. The writing is fun. It's very funny. It's, this is great. Matt and I bring our records to the cash register. A young girl with a septum ring and a buzz cut stands behind the counter with one earbud in. Usual stuff today, Matt. 
Just some light pickups. Matt places three albums on the counter. Swear I'm good at this by Diet Sig. Forever by Mystery Skulls. Yeah, 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 Mystery Skulls. And Greatest Hits by Remo Drive. Tight. Hey. The cashier rings Matt up and hangs back his albums in a bag. She stares at me suspiciously. He was a nerd. Yeah. That nerd is my buddy Brogan. Brogan, this beacon of human charm, is Molly. I got kicked out of art school for destroying my paintings at the end of every critique. It's performance art. Oh man, I really like Portal 2. I really like both Portal games. Lovely to meet you. Anyway, Matt, is the open mic night still on? You know it. Oh, the third wave's gonna do a special acoustic performance. I might see if I can get a few of the girls together. I see we get a few of the girls together. Is this an open mic night going on? Yeah, dude, we do it every month at the Coffee Spoon. Some amazing talent always comes through. Got a flyer for it right here. You and Amanda should come by that night. Matt blushes. Uh, I mean, if you're not doing anything. Will Bacon Bale be playing? <laughs> if only. I finish paying for my record and we head out of the store. Man, what a trip down memory lane. I haven't been in a record shop like that since bands had shag carpeting. <laughs> Now that you mention it, isn't it strange to think of all those weird little musical memories? How do you mean? Well, I think music is a very time and place sort of thing. A song is important to me, not only in that I think it sounds good, but where I was and what I was doing when I listened to it. Uh, bruh, um... I'm the Only One by Melissa Etheridge that always reminds me of driving in my mom's Lincoln. All the time. Or old Lincoln Mark 7 with the with the roof. It was like a special car, and we drove it everywhere. It was the first car she ever got because she took until her, like, fucking 30s to learn how to drive. And we had a great time in it. And that song was playing on the radio a lot. Yeah. Anyway. Well, I think music is very time and place sort of thing. A song is important to me, and not only in that I think it sounds good, but where I was and what I was doing when I listened to it. There's music that reminds me of exes, of struggling through school, of being so poor that I didn't know where my next meal was coming from. All that stuff, and listening to those songs remind me of those moments in my life. Yeah, now that I think of it, even the pop concert Amanda made me take her to as special as me. I mean, I'm not really a big fan of the band, but hearing their songs on the radio reminds me of how young and excited Amanda was. And then even that reminds me of a younger me going to see my favorite bands in concert with all my friends. We would always go to my favorite Cynthia Chapman's house, I said, parents Cynthia Chapman's house beforehand, and smoke pot in her basement like we were so sick, but are so slick. Her parents definitely knew what we were doing. Wait, when was the last time you smoked pot? Matt stops and thinks for a moment. It's been decades. Dude, me too. Where do you even get pot now? Is, it, is that what the kids call it these days? I don't know. But I bet I could find out. Do you want to get high and listen to our new records? Why not, dude? Go with the flow. I mean, I made some other interesting choices in this game so far. Matt pulls out his phone and starts texting. After a few minutes, he looks up and smiles at me. Ah, Molly's got a hookup. Says to meet in the alley near the coffee shop. Oh. For a second, I thought he was going to contact Robert, but I don't know if he deals in something as tame as weed. Okay, turns out that it's the feds, you make a break for it, and I'll take the heat. Just promise me that you'll raise Amanda like she was your own. You realize that weed has been legalized in this state, right? I uh, definitely knew that. But we live in dangerous times. Who knows what lurks in the seedy underbelly of Maple Bay. We could find ourselves on the wrong side of the deal gone bad. Just look out for Amanda. I swear. Oh, here's our guy. Coming around the corner in one of those nasty grease dumps or shrouded in darkness is a lean figure dressed in all black. Um, excuse me, Mr. Drugman? Surprise. <laughs> it's Lucian. The person almost jumps out of their skin. It's Lucian, Damien's son. Who sent you? <laughs> We're cool, man. We're cool. Says who? For all I know, you could be with the feds. A actually, weed is like a prove you're cool. What? I need to know that you're down or I bolt. Show him you're not wearing a wire. Impress him with your extensive knowledge of current drug lingo. Cite mutually assured destruction. <laughs> Sure. Look, man, we're both trying to buy drugs from you, and we know you sell drugs. You have dirt on us, we have dirt on you. We're in this together now. Look, it's fine. I get it. Buzzcut Molly <laughs> Buzzcut Molly. Buzzcut Molly said you were coming. Right, now that formalities are out of the way, let's make a deal. Ugh, alright. How much do you want? One. One what? Yeah. Oh. He means weed, Lucien. <laughs> yeah, but how much? One? <laughs> oh my god, look here. Take this and give me $10. Just don't tell my dad. Let's all forget this ever happened. 
I won't tell your dad if you don't. Lucien hands me a baggie of something and disappears down the alleyway. I open it and take a deep whiff. Smells like genuine drugs. Yes siree. That went smoothly. Yeah, we should get off public property before we smoke this. Great idea. Let's head back to my place, yeah? Watch, it's gonna be fake. Matt and I walk to our cul-de-sac and stop at a gas station on the way to buy rolling papers and soda. I feel like I'm 16 again. Hmm. Carmen Seach is having a sleepover tonight, so that gives us all the time we need to do drugs. <laughs> awesome, let's do some drugs. Matt pulls one of the records out of his bag and puts it on for us. I plop down on a comfy leopard couch and look around his place. There are a bunch of band posters and his record collection takes up an entire wall. Whoa, what a collection. Been collecting my whole life. It's nice to finally get them all in one place after being on the road for so much of my life. I had to ask my parents to hold on to them for me. Matt sits down next to me and we lay the marijuana drugs out on the coffee table. Uh, do you want to do the honors? Uh, please, it's your house. If you say so. Matt pulls out some rolling papers and sprinkles some of the beatnik tobacco onto a <laughs> beatnik tobacco onto a piece. He starts rolling it back and forth and the paper breaks almost immediately, spilling drugs all over the couch. Never was too good at this. Hey. Matt tries again and is able to successfully roll the nice looking weed cigarette. He hands me a lighter and the blunt, I think, and I take it. Well, let's uh open up the nug, smoke some of that gateway drug, rip that cold fairway. Is... is that a word? Oh, <laughs> oh no. I light the joint and inhale deeply. This is... not what I remembered. It's been a while though, maybe pot drugs have just gotten more potent since the last time I smoked? I pass the joint to Matt and cough a little bit. Should it sting this much or am I just a baby? Matt takes a hint and his eyes go wide. That's not weed. Oh god. Do we develop a taste for meth? No, no, it's... Matt takes another hint and winces. Yeah, this is oregano. I sniff the air. Yeah, that would definitely explain why it smells like a pizza place in here. That little punk ripped us off. Oh well, we can still relax and enjoy the music sober. You know what? You're right. We sit and listen through this Daya Di Sig album that Matt brought, which is catchy as hell. I look around the room again and see photos of Carmen Sita growing up. I spot a young woman with a huge smile in one of the pictures with the two. Who's that? Oh, that's Rosa. She was Carmen Sita's mother. She died when Carmen Sita was young. I'm sorry to hear that. Oh, Amanda lost Alex at a young age, too. I can understand how hard that must have been. I look around again, spotting a framed gig poster hanging on the wall. On it, there's an illustration of Matt and Rosa surrounded by flowers. The cursive, reading, cursive lettering reads, Stillness the Dancing. Looks like they played in the Sound Garden over a decade ago. Were you two in a band together? Yeah. That was the reason I was touring so much when I was younger. We traveled the whole country in this rinky-dink little van. It was hard to start, but once we started gaining notoriety and seeing how much our songs meant to kids, it was just incredible. Wow, this seems like a life some people only dream of. Hey. It was. It was difficult at the same time. I couldn't have done it without someone by my side. Rosa and I knew that we couldn't do it forever. Long hours on the road, missing your family, sleeping in a van, all that stuff. So once we became pregnant with Carmen Sita, we put down our roasts in our favorite town to play in, right here. Since she was a kid, Rosa always had a dream to own a quiet little coffee shop. She, uh, she died before it opened. Um, so sorry. Hey. Don't be. I'm not really sure what to say. I couldn't possibly count the number of times I told people the same thing after Alex died. Matt, she gets up to flip the record. Next to the turntable, I notice a dusty piano. Do you play? Ah, uh, I'm out of practice. I used to jam on the keys back in the day. Oh, yeah? I fronted the hot hottest seven-piece ska band that Eagle Rock Bay High School had to offer. No way, you had a ska phase? Phase? Ska never dies. <laughs> Except for Ska Minus Manifesto, who broke up after the senior talent show to pursue solo careers. Hey. Dude, that's so rad. Matt pulls out the piano bench. Give me some of that two-tone love. Oh, man, let's see if I still got it. Hey. I sit down at the piano. Go with the classics, stick to your ska roots. Anyway, here's Wonderwall. You know what, ska for life. Hey, I think I'm doing it, I'm playing ska. Oh. Wait, that was just smoke on the water. Matt, I've forgotten how to play. The deep purple is always appreciated, nonetheless. Alright, buddy, can you top that? I, uh, I shouldn't. Ah, come on. No, um, it's been a long time. Never too late to get back into it. Matt, you just sat through a butchered version of Deep Purple Smoke on the Water. How much worse can it be? <laughs> Matt stares at the piano for a second. Okay. I'm, uh, okay. Matt closes his eyes and runs his fingers over the keys. He breathes in deep and starts playing a melody. If 
I didn't know that he hadn't just played a piano in a long time, I would never have guessed it. Matt plays a soft, sweet tune filled with emotion. I've never heard this before. Is this one of his original works? This is so cool. Matt finishes the song and finally opens his eyes. How was that? That was amazing. Oh, it's nothing. Come on, man, that was a killer. You gonna pull that out for the, pull that out for the open mic night? Oh no, I, I never play at those. Well, why not? You're really good. It's just, I just don't do it anymore. I just don't like being up there and alone, having so many people stare at me. It doesn't feel fun anymore. I can sense that Matt's getting uncomfortable at the thought of it. I won't push him any further. All right, man, but I hope you know how beautiful your music is. Uh, thanks. Matt and I sit and listen to more records until it gets late and decide that I need to go need to get to bed. Matt walks me to my door. Let's never tell anyone about the oregano, okay? <laughs> Deal. Wait, can I tell my doctor? I don't know anything about the health effects of smoking oregano. <laughs> I think we'll be fine. Hey. Night, dude. I smile. Night. Aw. I walk inside and the house is dark, save for the sliver of light coming from beneath Amanda's door. I knock lightly on the door and enter Amanda's room. She's sitting at her desk with her camera, editing photos. Hey, Amanda. Amanda swivels around in her chair to face me and slumps mm -hmm. down. What well, smells like a pizza parlor in here? What? Nothing. Uh, so, uh, what's up? Dad, I'm hungry. Huh? Wait, no. Hi, hungry! Now, I'm dead! <laughs> Amanda collapses onto the floor. I promised myself I'd never let it come to this. Sorry, kiddo, you set it up, I spike it down. <laughs> You're a monster. <laughs> Want some spaghetti? <laughs> yes, please. Huh? Amanda and I boil pasta and heat up- Well, now I want pasta. Well, I boil- Well, I boil pasta and heat up sauce while Amanda watches. Despite my pest efforts, I'm not able to set it on fire. How was record collecting? It was great. Did you know that Matt used to play in a band? No way. Was he good? I don't know if the band was good, but he played some piano for me tonight, and it was amazing. He played piano for you? Dude. Yeah, I brought it up that he should play at the open mic night that's happening in his coffee shop, but he got kind of weird about it. Hey, I saw a flyer for that. We should go. It's not too late to start a father-daughter punk band and play a couple tunes there. Yeah, let me break out my glockenspiel. I think I only know how hot cross buttons, but we can work off the chord progression. The art in this game is very, very good. Amanda and I have a nice dinner before she goes back to her room to do photography stuff. I end up watching True Life, I'm a House Hunter. <laughs> They're staging an intervention for the House Hunter, who is crying uncontrollably over the color of the walls. They know they can paint the walls of their house any color they want, right? Tell that to my- oh my god. Don't even get me started. That song is stuck in my head all night. Oh, I wish I could have heard it. You're young, you have your health, now it's time to take risks. Ah, how far up does that tattoo go? Yeah, all day. Like King of Carrot Flowers 203. It's better to be early than late. Well, it's been a long day. I'm just about ready to pack it in. After a few bites of ice cream from the freezer, I turn off all the lights and walk down the hall to my room. I wonder if Amanda's still awake. That kid needs some sleep. As I pass the room, I can hear a faint sound, but can't quite make out what it is. I get a little closer. Is she crying? I knock gently on the door. Hey, Amanda? The crying immediately stops. Not right now. Her voice sounds strange. She sniffles. I need to make sure she's okay. I open the door. <laughs> In the dark, I can see Amanda's outline in the middle of her bed, knees hooked up against her body. What's wrong, Amanda? Is everything okay? I don't want to talk about it. Something happened? Something happened? No! Nothing happened! Go away! One more pry. Amanda. Get out! Okay, okay. I quickly leave her room and shut the door behind me. Once the door closes, I can hear her crying again. Wow. What has her so upset? She seemed fine earlier. She's usually so open with me. Did I do something wrong? Is she mad at me? I guess if she wasn't before, she definitely is now. I can't even remember the last time she snapped at me like that. I have a hard time falling asleep, but when I finally do, I'm still thinking about Amanda. Oh, poor kid. After a very long night of a little long night of very little sleep, I roll out of bed and make myself a pot of coffee. Amanda should be up for school soon. Maybe she's not willing to talk about whatever's bothering her. Mm. About ten minutes before she's supposed to leave, Amanda comes out of her room and makes a beeline for the freezer. Morning, Amanda. Morning. She drops a frozen waffle into the toaster and slams the freezer door. She won't look at me. Yikes. So, anything big going on at school today? Mm. No. Okay. Do you need to ride to school? 
No. Want some coffee? Amanda pulls the toaster lever up and takes her still freezer burn waffle out before it's finished cooking. I have to go. Amanda picks up her bag and storms out. Ow! My ears. Oh, okay. I haven't seen her act like this in a long time. Usually short-lived, but it always hurts. Hopefully this blows over and things are back to normal soon. I wish I had one of these little racks right here. I need to, like, make one. I sit back at the kitchen table and look at a picture of Amanda and I hanging out, uh, hanging on a wall. In it, I'm teaching her to ride a bike. Her face is a mixture of excitement and fear and adulterated fear. I remember how determined she was. Every time she would fall off and scrape her knee, she would get up and try it again. Finally, I had to stop her because she was bleeding everywhere. Then she started to cry because she didn't think she needed bandages and wanted to keep trying. As I put the bike away, she just stood in the middle of the street and screamed. Then I took her for ice cream, and it was like nothing even happened. Now I want ice cream. Ooh, I have ice cream. I have coffee ice cream. I should go eat that. After getting in a bit of a thought, I decide that if I force her to talk about it, I'm only going to make things worse. But I have an idea. I start rummaging around for ingredients. I hear Amanda walk in the door. Instead of heading for the kitchen like she usually does, she makes a beeline to her room. She's clearly trying to avoid me. Hey, pumpkin? What? Can you come here for a sec? There's a moment of silence. Yeah, I wanted to say sorry about last night. I'm just worried about you, kiddo. I get scared when I know something's wrong, and I get even more scared when I feel like I can't do anything about it. Dad, I... So, just, whatever it is, and you don't have to tell me if you don't want to, but whatever it is, just know that you have a dad in your corner who wants you to be happy. Uh -huh. Honey, you know I'm bad with words, so I was hoping I could speak a language we both understand. I pull a cake out of the refrigerator and place it on the table. Hopefully the frosting is set by now. Ta-da! Dad. It took me a really long time because I ran out of red frosting somewhere around sad and had to start over and sorry you're sad, but I support you 100%. <laughs> the three candles. Oh. This is beautiful. It's strawberry. Oh, fuck yeah. Amanda gives me a big ol' hug. I grab some plates and forks and serve us up some delicious cake. So, it's really stupid. What is? This whole thing. I know I've been really weird lately and there's just... I don't even know how to explain it. I feel like I might have to make you a chart. I'm listening. Do you want me to take mm -hmm. notes? I guess I should start from the top. So you know how Emma R is going to that fancy art school in California, right? Emma R. The one who puked and dead calls it beyond? The best friend? The other one? Oh, fuck. Oh, no. I can't remember Emma R. She was the one who puked and dead calls it beyond. The other one? I guess you're not technically wrong. It's good to have fallbacks like that one. <laughs> Anyways, ever since she got the acceptance letter, I've been feeling like she's drifting away, you know? And she's been spending a lot more time with Grace and Emma P. I just thought it was all in my head for a while, but then I found out from Rosie M. that both of the Emmas, Grace and Noah, all went to a party at Mackenzie's F's on the same night they all told me they were busy studying for the Cal K B final. Yikes. <sighs> so, another important piece of information is, uh, god, this is embarrassing. Um, I have a crush on Noah, and, um, uh, that's a thing. What? Oh, uh, I had no idea. I definitely didn't know that. Okay. You're a bad liar. So are you. Learned it from the worst. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so the only person I told about the crush was Emma R, and she promised not to tell anybody. I didn't confront them about the party thing because I didn't want to start drama, so I just keep quiet and keep going about my business. Amanda sighs. And then one day I invite everyone out to get nachos at the mall, and after not texting me back for like two hours, even though none of them ever put their phones down for more than 60 seconds, they all said they're busy, like, simultaneously. That's suspicious hell. So I tell them, never mind, I'll just eat nachos at home, right? But we were out of chips, and I really, really wanted nachos. Totally understandable. So I go to the mall anyway, I get to the food court, and who do I see there but Grace, Emma P, Emma R, and Noah, all hanging out together and eating nachos without me. What? Those bitches. It gets better, I'm standing by the escalators watching them, and I realize that Noah has his arm around Emma R, which is kind of weird, right? But then they kiss. No. <laughs> Yes, I know, so I storm over there and I'm like, hey, and Grace drops a nacho on her shirt because of course she does, and Emma R just like glares at me. Grace, Grace, nothing is coming up. I don't know who that is. Grace is, uh, gossipy one? I know. Grace is the one nobody really likes, or I guess that's me now. But anyway, nobody will say anything, and I'm just like, you guys suck, which I realize is not the most eloquent thing to say, but I was very angry and really embarrassed, and I just wanted to get out of there. So I left without nachos, might I add, which only further contributed to the shitty day, and immediately drafted a super long text to the group chat asking them why they've been so weird. 
and I wrote another one to Emma R asking how long the Noah thing has been going on. And sorry, I know that's a lot. You're still following. I'm a little confused, but I think I understand. That's okay. You're trying. So what happens next? Oh, okay. Get a load of this. Emma R says, <laughs> you know, well, let me just read it to you. Amanda pulls out her phone and reads word for word an arduously long string of text messages. Can you believe that? I cannot believe that. I care so much about Amanda's social life and mental well-being, but man, do I not understand what she's talking about. This is all beyond me, but I'm trying my hardest to be supportive. They were dating in secret for, like, months. So I told her that she's being a really terrible friend, and she's like, well, if you think I'm so terrible, then just stop being my friend. And I was like, okay. And then she left me on red, and... Wait, left me on red? What's that? Oh, like, she saw my message and didn't reply, and I know because there are red receipts. I don't know what red receipts are, but I'm just gonna nod and pretend I understand. It's like with Robert the other day. Gotcha! So, while this is all happening, I'm talking to MP about how mad I am because she's being kind of unreasonable. She'd be, she's at least being kind of reasonable. And I'm venting to her about how pissed I am at everybody and stuff. And then out of nowhere, Noah texts me and is like, how could you say that about me? And I'm like, say what about you? And he tells me that MP sent screenshots of everything I told her to the group chat that I got kicked out of. Alright, I think you lost me a screenshot, but it definitely sounds bad. There's so much more, but honestly, it's all just really stupid teenager stuff. Oh yeah, Red Receipts is what it's called now. I I didn't know it had a name for a long time. The bottom line is that everybody dropped me, half my grade hates me, and now I have no friends. But your friends fucking suck. Amanda, I'm so sorry. I almost expected it from everybody else, but... Emma R has been there since Dad died. I can't believe she would just stab me in the back like that. I'm not even that mad that she's dating Noah. I'm just upset that she lied to me about it for so long. Amanda stabs at the remnants of her cake. Okay, I take it back. I'm kind of mad she's dating Noah. Like, what did I do wrong? What did everybody just suddenly decide I'm not cool anymore? Why wasn't I enough? I don't understand. And as mad as I am at everybody, like, I miss them, Dad. I miss them, Dad. Amanda looks so dejected, I almost can't take it. What could I possibly say to help? Anyways, that's it. That's a whole sordid tale. Thanks for listening. Tune in next week for more hot gossip. Wow. I know, it's pretty dumb. It's actually not dumb. It's like a perfectly valid reason to be pissed off and like all sad, you know? No, it's a stupid thing to be upset over. Amanda, your feelings are real. Don't ever be mad at yourself for having feelings. I guess. Unless you've been secretly been a robot who's been approximating human feelings this whole time. <laughs> Dad, if I was a robot, I would have transformed into a monster truck a long, long time ago. But seriously, I know you probably don't want advice, but I feel like it's my duty as a dad to bestow upon you a few nuggets of fatherly wisdom. Not all friendships last forever. Real friends don't do that. High school suck. Okay, the problem is all of these are true. Not all friendships last forever. People are going to come in and out of your life. Just how it works. Not every friendship is going to last forever, so cherish your friends while you have them. And when it's over, don't dwell too much on the bad stuff. You had some good times with them, R, but you guys grew apart. Learn from it and keep moving forward. There's so many new friends to make. They're going to be so much cooler than MR and the rest. Ultimately, I think this says way more about their character than it does about yours, because you're amazing. And they can see that, well, that's their problem. If they can't see that, then well, that's their problem. I'll keep that in mind. I look down at the table. Did we just eat the whole cake? Yes, we did just eat that whole cake. Well, good talk. Amanda gets off to go to her room. Before she closes the door, she turns around. Hey, Bobs. Huh. Yes? Thank you. You are always welcome. Love you, Amanda. Love you too, Dad. I love you too, Dad. Oh. Welcome. Yes, yeah, sometimes you gotta have your feelings. Okay, so it's Craig, Matt, Brian again. Oh, wait. Papa! Just killed a man. Well, I didn't, but Robert might have at some point. I don't know which one yours is. So far, I've gone on one date with all of them, two dates with these two. I'm just kind of going going through them like in order and then getting the messages whenever I get them. Right? Usually high school drama is treated as, you know, it actually is like, oh, it is just stupid kid stuff. Look at these dumb teenagers being stupid. But, like, this one's actually, you know, it's, it gives you the option to not be a complete douchebag to your kid. 
I'm so sorry, Hans. I don't think your dad's gonna return with those cigarettes. It is six now, but let's do one more thing before my voice gives out from talking so long. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we'll go fishing. I want to see how that works. Hey, Daisy and I are going fishing tomorrow. You in or out? Oh no, I've been dreading this day. I accidentally boasted about my abilities as a fisherman to Brian, and now he's challenging me to another dad-off. I've been doing my fishing research online, but I'm nowhere close to being an expert. Still, though, I have to accept. I type back to Brian. Sounds great, man. Super excited to catch all those fish. And my lawn could use another good mowing. That'll show him. <laughs> Brian responds back, letting me know that tomorrow he'll pick us up at an hour I had previously forgotten existed. Yeah, that's gonna be a rough start. Amanda. Amanda comes into the room from the kitchen, eating a cheese stick by biting it off piece by piece like some kind of monster. I didn't raise you like that. What? It's called string cheese and not chompy cheese for a reason, Amanda. Can't you just call me in here to criticize my controversial string cheese eating technique or what? No, Amanda, we have to go fishing tomorrow. Well, you have to go fishing. I get to play with Brian's dog. How do I become a master of fishing overnight? You went fishing in the Girl Scouts, didn't you? No, my stint in the Girl Scouts was brief and purely transactional. Thought I could get free cookies, but I didn't know how I had to, like, be outside and tie knots and stuff. But I have to be Brian. Dad, let me tell you a story. Do you remember last summer how I applied for a job at that coffee shop across town? Right, it's like... How dare you? Next I'm gonna see you biting into a row of Kit Kats instead of snapping them off by one, one by one. I'm gonna see you eating pull apart Twizzlers in the bunch instead of pulling them string by string. You, you, you leave. The door is there. Don't let it hit you all the way out. Do you remember last summer how I applied for a job at that coffee shop across town? Uh, give me a refresher. During the interview, they asked me if I knew how to work an espresso machine, and I really wanted the job, so I lied and said yes. On that first morning, there was a line out the door, and within half an hour, I severely burned my hand, and they told me to go home and never come back. I still have a scar from that. Of course I remember. What does it have to do with fishing? The burn is a metaphor, Dad. I don't get it. You can lead a horse to water. Water horses have to do with fish and burns. Dad, please. I don't get your obsession with competing against Brian. He started it. You wouldn't understand. It's a dad thing. Please try explaining it to me. Okay, Brian's just... He just thinks that he's so much better than me, and he purposely reminds me of that whenever he can. It's like he has to one-up me. I have to beat him at his own game. Is that what you think is happening here? No, Amanda. Okay, good. I know that's what's happening. All right, Pops. We should both be getting some sleep. See you in the morning. Night, Panda. I brush my teeth and throw on some pajamas. I climb into bed, set my alarm, and close my eyes. Okay, sleep. Yeah, it never works, does it? I am wide awake. I can't help but think about the last time I went fishing, hoping that there's something I can glean from it to give me an edge over Brian. I was about nine years old. My dad woke me up one morning and told me to get dressed and meet him downstairs. It was still dark out. I had no idea what was going on, but before I knew it, we were both alone on a freezing cold lake. I had to sit there for hours while I got hot and muggy, the air thick with bugs. I picked up mosquito bites while my dad sat in stony silence, fishing pole in one hand and a bear in the other. We didn't catch anything. On the long drive home, my father brought me a pack of, bought me a pack of cigarettes and didn't say a thing. That didn't help, and I think I have some repressed sadness about my father. I'll deal with that later. <laughs> I'm sitting on a boat in the middle of a body of water. I can't see any land, but I know it's a lake. The water is placid and still. I'm holding a fishing pole. I'm just, uh, I just really like the scenery right now. This is really nice. I don't understand why, but it feels like my life depends on catching fish right now. I cast my lure into the water and wait, and wait, and wait. My whole being is filled with hopelessness as I watch the line disappear into the depths below. You used the wrong lure. I look up and see my father, just as he looked that one cold morning, disapproving. I'm panicking now. I pull the lure up and try to grab a different one, but all the lures in my tackle box are the exact same. I look up to my father for guidance, but he's gone. I try casting again, but I can't hold my footing. My boat tips over and I fall into the water. Sinking further and further, I see the multitudes of fish that had been lying just below the surface, all swimming around me as if to taunt me. One fish swims up to me. He has Brian's eyes. You gotta use a neutral buoyancy lure if you're trying to catch trout, buddy. 
I had jolt awake to the sound of my alarm. It's fishing day. That would explain the weird dream. I groggily slip on clothes and get ready. I spot Amanda's door, half open, and see her curled up in a half ma and curled up in a mountain of blankets. Walking over to her bed, I give her a tiny kiss on the forehead. Fishing day, kiddo. You ready? Urf, no. Well, you gotta get up. I can't do this without you. Also, stop sleeping in your clothes. Amanda pulls her comforter over her head. Never. Amanda. Great. I'll get up in a minute. All right, Brian should be here in 20, so you better not just go back to sleep. Amanda sticks her head through the blanket to wave me away. Hand through the blanket to wave me away. I leave her room and make myself some coffee and another cup with lots of cream and sugar for Amanda whenever she gets up. Amanda eventually wanders in and chugs her coffee while I do world jumbles. I hear the doorbell ring. That must be Brian. Still rubbing her eyes, we walk outside to see Brian. He's decked out in fishing gear. Daisy's falling asleep next to him. <laughs> Early bird gets a worm, buddy! This guy is, like, the dadliest dad to ever fucking exist. It's, like, his dad power is over 9,000. It's, it's, it's overwhelming. You ready to fish? I was born ready. My eyes narrow in on Brian. It's a good day to die. <laughs> Hop on in, guys. Let's get this fishing party started. I walk over to the driver's side door and open it. Woof, woof. Brian's dog immediately hops into the driver's seat, wagging his tail furiously. Oh, you beautiful dog. Can I see your license, sir? <laughs> Maxwell, let Brogan sit. Maxwell obediently hops into the back to cuddle with Daisy. Amanda settles in next to Maxwell and Daisy and immediately falls asleep. You ready for an adventure? I'm ready for glory. <laughs> I struggle to stay awake as we drive to the outskirts of town. Country music quietly plays from the radio as I watch trees pass by. So where exactly are we headed? It's about an hour north of here, a little spot I've been going to since I was a kid. My dad used to take me there all the time. I don't think anybody else knows about it. Of course, it's the fishing spot. I brought everything we need so that we can catch some trout, have a nice little fire, and enjoy the nature. My, uh, my fishing pole is in the shop, getting it tuned up. Do you maybe have an extra I could borrow? But of course, it's probably not as nice as it sounds like yours is, though. Right. I am digging a hole here. <laughs> I stare out at the forest, lining the highway. The sun is just barely over the horizon, scattering dusky pink light through the trees. For a split second, I spot a deer grazing on the side of the road before it leaps back into the brush. After a nice, quiet drive, Brian eventually tells me to pull up the highway and onto a dirt road. The car bumps along until we reach a clearing that opens up to a magnificent lake. Well, here we are. I step out of the car and help, help Brian unload our gear as Maxwell runs around us barking. The kids wake up and wander to the shore, where Daisy tries to teach Amanda how to skip rocks. Brian and I carry the tackle boxes and cooler down to the edge of the lake, where he has a canoe waiting. Ah, great, it's still one piece. Hold on, help me out with Maxwell. I help Brian place a tiny dog-sized life vest onto Maxwell. Oh, woof, woof. All right, your turn. Brian hands me a lime green life vest. Maybe if I fall in, you'll save me. I can swim things. Let's be saucy. If I fall in, I'm counting on you to rescue me. I'll suit yourself. The fucking eggplants. It took me a while to realize that those were eggplants. Brian turned to Amanda and Daisy, who are still skipping rocks. You kids want to fish? I'm good with just throwing rocks into the water. Amanda hurls a rock into the pond with gusto. Yeah, take that water. Amanda, you're supposed to be skipping them. Isn't that what we're doing? Daisy, don't you want to fish? I think catching fish is kind of inhumane. We're gonna go explore in the woods and look at bugs and stuff. Yeah, I am loving this game. It is great. It's so cute. It's so sweet. I love it. Alright, be safe. Don't go too far. Always oh, probably the kind of dad who always wanted his kid to fish, but his, his kid is a huge nerd. And she doesn't like fishing. <laughs> Just like mine. Brian puts the life vest around himself, and we throw all of our equipment into the canoe. Maxwell happily jumps in and takes his place looking out over the front of the boat. I get into the canoe as Brian shoves off. We paddle together to get ourselves into the middle of the lake. Aw. I love how he's just standing up in the boat. Most freshwater fish usually feed at dusk and dawn, which is why I had to get you up so early. Yeah, I know. That's pretty common fisherman knowledge, after all. Fisherman knowledge that I am knowledgeable about. Still a gambling man? You know it! <laughs> Let's see who can catch more fish. You can you can catch more than one? <laughs> Sounds easy enough to me. What's on the line? Besides all the fish I'm going to catch, obviously. I was thinking something a little more high stakes than mowing the lawn. Custody of our children? More than that. Let's say, if I win, I get your weed whacker. 
the Wack Master 2000 that's a limited edition. Uh, Daisy is like the cutest kid I've ever seen in my entire life. Oh yeah, that shirt. I saw that shirt and I was like, I need it. I need that shirt in real life and also I need to be that buff in order to wear it. But I would still wear it. But, but like, yeah, my avatar needs it. But if you win, you get my pole saw, the Reach and Cut 3000. Oh my god, dude, take the pole saw that's- oh my god, that's so much better than Weed Whacker. It's better to pull weeds. He's offering a pole saw for a Weed Whacker? This guy's crazy! The cordless version? That's the one. Shit, the Reach and Cut 3000 is state-of-the-art. My Weed Whacker is a prized possession, but there are those hard-to-reach branches in the back of the yard that have been begging for a pruning. You're on. We shake on it. I suddenly remember that I don't know how to fish. My foolish fatherly pride will one day be my undoing. I watch as Brian ties the lure, and though some stuff I can't quite follow with his fishing pole, he casts into the lake. Oh boy, now I have to do that. I stare down at the tackle box and at the pole in my hand. Did- is- is there a hook on the line first? Insult the fish. Stretch before physical activity. Let's put some bait on that hook. I fish a worm from the styrofoam container Brian bought. It's slippery, but I think I can get it onto the hook if I just focus. Oh god, I'm bleeding. Oh god, the blood's everywhere. <laughs> the worm is not on the hook. I need some help? No, I meant to do that. The blood uh, attracts the fish. They can smell it up to a mile away, you know. I think that's sharks. No, it's, it's definitely fish. <laughs> now what? Perform the fish mating call. Tie a knot or something? Meditate. Well, let's attempt to tie a knot. I take my pole and tie an elaborate looking knot to impress Brian, the classic hunter's bend. I learned that one in my youth. Yet this one isn't coming apart any time soon. With this knot, I will cast my heavenly line upon the unsuspecting water and deliver unto us a bountiful harvest. I look over to Brian. Doesn't seem to be paying attention. Let's cast this sucker. I pull my rod back and launch the lure as hard as I can. Did you remember to... Uh, and the lure flies off the line and sails far, far away, landing in the lake with a loud sploosh. Ah, sorry, I judged the wind speed wrong. This cold air drives the pressure down. <laughs> Go on and take my pole. I know it's hard switching to a new pole you're not used to. I'll fix up another lure. Oh yeah, I've gone out with Damien. He's hilarious. I love him. I love his aesthetic and his appreciation of Victorian era stuff. His vintage style, not vintage values attitude. Fantastic. I think my favorite is Hugo so far. But also, I love all of them. Uh, Thunder, Field of Thunder, that's Imagine Dragons. Yeah, Imagine Dragons is the song that did the Thunder, Field of Thunder, Lightning and the Thunder, and then it does the high-pitched voice, that's the one. Brian hands me his pole with a smile, and I just sit there feeling like an idiot. Solo from Kit Charlemagne, it's the greatest solo ever made. Oh, fishing around here, oh, it's a, it's a match three, look at these cute fish! Oh, we got a pike! And, wait, so wait, is that a large mouth or a small mouth? I can't remember my fish. I go fishing a lot, but I can't remember my fucking fish. Fishing around here is easy. They group up. All I gotta do is line up three of the same species and reel them in. Okay, I'm guessing there's something about getting people to talk about Imagine Dragons that makes you... I don't know. Fishing around here is easy. They group up. All you gotta do is line up three of the same fish and reel them in. I need to match three of the same species? I can't tell which fish is which. Match that fish. Okay, they have to be in a line? Or just in a group? Wait, do they have to be in a line or in a group? If I click on... Oh, wait, wait, wait. That's a largemouth bass. Largemouth bass, popular sport fish made infamous by the singing Billy the Bass novelty toy and decoration. It's easily confused with the smallmouth bass. Okay, wait, if I do, like... No, I totally understand. You're having an off day. It's no big deal. Okay, wait, wait, wait. There, they have to be in a line? No, I didn't click on that one. Oh, I have to switch them. Oh, I have to switch them. Uh, I forgot how to play, I forgot how to play those. Oh, cool. I'm trying to finish this one last date. Huh? No, I didn't quick save before this. I'm probably gonna fuck it up. No quick saves. We die like gamers. Let's do this. Yeah, I hope you have a good time.
I'm not gonna win anything because I've been very slow at this, but you know what? That's fine. You know what, if I don't do good, then I just don't do good, and that's just how it is. Now you're fishing. Now you're fishing. Now you're fishing. I'm not good at, like, planning match threes, you know, where you, like... Nice I love the slapping noises because they're fish. That's hilarious. Kind of gross, but, you know, it's fish. Uh, fuck. I'm really bad at this kind of game. I think it's cute how there are a bunch of little, like, mini-games and stuff. Okay, um... There's probably some really obvious ones that I'm just, like, totally missing. Oh, like that one. Oh, I'm, I'm, uh... A? How was that an A? That was, like, a C at most. <laughs> Game is coded to compensate for the low frame rate. Oh, geez. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta get them save, save states going on there. Blap. Blap, blap, go the fish. Good work! Look at situations positively. <laughs> wow, this is way tougher than I thought. I look over to Brian, who's smiling and obviously enjoying his time out here on the lake. I will crush it. <laughs> Suddenly, the fishing pole jumps in my hand and reflexively tug upwards. Like I got something big. The tip of the pole dips down repeatedly and the line starts to run. Reel it in! I finally get the fish right up next to the boat. It's a long, beautiful rainbow trout. Brian hands me a net. It's all yours. I lean down and notice that my hands are shaking with excitement. This is just, this fish is bigger than all the ones Brian's caught. That pole saw is mine. All that the entire canoe tips over with me. I find myself sinking into the lake. I should have taken the life vest. You should have taken the life vest. All of a sudden, I'm embraced under the water and pulled into Brian's arms. His strong, beautiful, manly arms. I'm finally dragged upwards, sputtering water. All of our gear floats on the surface. Maxwell doggy paddles around us on surface, having a great time. Y'all right? Does that count as one? <laughs> well, seeing as all our fish are now swimming safely back in the lake, I guess so. Brian laughs. Let's get you to shore. Brian and I flip the canoe back over and fill it with our now soaking wet gear. We row back to the shore with Maxwell in tow. Once we got to the beach, Maxwell darts off into the woods. Oh yeah, dry off, King. Brian takes off his shirt. Dots of lake water glisten in the sun all across his strong back. Man, all that general contracting must have built the guy like an ox. I hope he doesn't notice me staring. Uh. I'm getting a fire going so we can dry off. Wanna hand me yours? I, uh, yeah, yes, okay. I reluctantly take off my own shirt and toss it to Brian. I suddenly wish I had done more sit-ups in my life, or any sit-ups at all, really. Uh, and another thing you bested me in, stupid sexy Brian. You might as well fry that shirt up. Seems like it's the only lunch we'll have. A, hey, cause it's, a, hey, is that the, a? Hey. The day's young. We can fish from the shore. Once Brian gets the fire going, I sit and try to dry off my pants. Brian sets a couple a couple lures out by the water's edge. We're probably gonna have to put the kibosh, kibosh on the competition for now. Until another day. My stomach growls. I don't know. You hungry? Oh, I'm fine. Brian reaches into his cargo shorts and pulls out a few granola bars. I have a small child, but I am flush with snacks. Brian joins me by the fire and I accept the cargo short granola. What better kind... And now we're back to waiting. Where do the girls get off to? Shouldn't they be back by now? Ah, I wouldn't worry about it too much. There are a couple of smart kids. That's what I'm worried about. They're too smart. They've probably established a small rural government by this point and installed themselves as leaders. I take a look around at the take a look around at the sun cresting the tree line, casting the entire lake in a warm golden glow. The forest seems to be coming alive now. Birds chirp in the distance. Wow, nature is beautiful. A mosquito bites me. I slap my neck and curse. Nature sucks. Here you go, bud. Brian hands me a bottle of bug spray. I regretfully take it and douse myself. Oh, I've always hated how this stuff smells. Really? I've always kind of liked it. Reminds me of being outside. Maybe you and I have different sentiments on the outdoors. Maxwell comes bounding up to me, a huge stick in his mouth. He drops it at my feet and looks at me expectantly. Throw the stick towards the woods. Fake out throw. Break the stick in half to assert your dominance. Throw the stick. I hurl the stick as hard as I can toward the tree line. Maxwell bolts after it, running as fast as his stubby little legs can carry him. Which, consequently, is not very fast. It is very cute, though. Hey. Nice throw, Brogan. I turn away so he can't see me blush. Maxwell brings the stick back to me, clearly proud of himself. Good boy, Maxwell. You're a good and speedy boy. You're the world champ of fetch. It's time for the pets. What's the plan? 
butt pats never fail. Scratch behind the ear, rub that belly. Oh, we going for belly pats? We going for belly pats? Maxwell rolls over and lets me rub his belly. He wiggles on the grass, clearly loving it. I feel like a bit of a third wheel here. Why are my belly rubs? Ha ha! I, uh, ha! I'm so flustered I can barely say anything. I just focus on petting Maxwell and hope Brian doesn't notice how much I'm sweating. While I'm playing with Maxwell, fish begin routinely pulling on Brian's lines. I watch Brian effortlessly fillet the fish, squeezing a bit of lemon on them and frying them up in a cast iron pan. Before we know it, we have a feast fit for a couple of shirtless dudes. Amanda and Daisy emerge from the woods, looking totally unscathed. Whoa, Dad Bod Patrol, Dad Bod Patrol, I'm gonna have to issue you both a citation and demand you both put your shirts on. There are children present. Brian tosses me my now dry shirt. I pull it over my head, thankful that I will no longer be distracted by Brian and his pecs. Where have you guys been? Studying entomology. What? We were playing with bugs. Hmm. I expected you guys to be more covered in, like, mud and stuff. Daisy looks offended. What do you take me for, a child? You kinda are. Amanda puts a hand on Daisy's shoulder. Dad. Right. <laughs> Amanda, every teen, is fantastic. We take a seat around the fire, and Brian serves us all a generous pile it serves us all generous piles of fish on paper plates. It's absolutely delicious. Why does he have to be good at everything? Whoa. Fish taste okay? Daisy and Amanda both nod furiously, mouths full of fish. It's incredible. I've never had fish this good. Well, bro, it's fresh right out the lake. That's the only way to do it. Rogan. Yeah, it's it's great. Old Harding family recipe. Why are your pants wet? Well, Amanda, we were out there on the lake, and then, and then I accidentally tipped over that boat. Don't worry, all the gear floated to the surface and we didn't lose anything, right, Brogan? I, uh, yeah, that's exactly what happened. I can't believe he just covered for me. Gosh, he even out-humbles me. He's trying to beat me at everything, <laughs> including my world-famous sense of humility. We finish our fish and end up playing catch with Maxwell for a little while before we decide to head out. After cleaning up the camp, we pack up the station wagon and let Maxwell into the back seat. The poor pup falls asleep in a cuddle puddle with Amanda and Daisy. They've had a long day. Been an ordeal today, bud. Let me drive you guys home. I want to prove that I'm the most awake dad on the block, but yeah, I'm beat. Fine. Ugh. As we drive away, I take one last look at the lake disappearing behind us and smile. I rest my head against the window, and the low rumble of dirt road beneath us lulls me into a peaceful sleep. All this music. I kind of hate the term cuddle puddle, but also, it is kind of, you know, if there's a dog involved, I'm okay with it. Hey, sleepyhead. I opened my eyes and realized that I had dozed off in the car. I self-consciously wipe a bit of drool off my chin. Oh, hey, I was, uh, resting my eyes. Uh, just in case we suddenly have to jump into any sort of conflict, so I'm super awake for it. Ready to fight. My strong arms. It's all good, you're in some rest, buddy. Thanks for coming out with us today. I had a lot of fun with you. Thanks for inviting us. I also had fun, actually. Glad to hear it. Take it easy, yeah? You too. Take it the easiest. <laughs> Brian chuckles to himself as he unloads the car. Amanda and I get inside and immediately collapse onto the couch. Long day. Yep. I was so close to that pole saw. Pole saw? Yeah, Brian and I were competing to see who could catch the most fish and... Ah, uh, stop. Why do you care so much? Man, to Panda, just look at the guy. He's so obviously got my number and he's rubbing my face in it. Dad, I love you, but you're kind of dumb sometimes. Dumb, or clearly the superior dad. You know what? I don't have the energy. I don't have any of the energy required to properly unpack your weird fixation with asserting your masculinity. <laughs> right? The, peak, the pink kiwi bird plushie is here is so cute. I'm going to bed. Night. Amanda slides off the couch and face down onto the floor. I am a tired slug. Amanda, that floor is disgusting. I don't care. Well, night, honey. Night, pops. No only acceptable time and place for decaf is never ended the trash. Friendship, dad snark, beard, competition, bass, shirtless. That's a 10 out of 10 if ever I've seen one. Oh my god. Oh my god, it's a strawberry kiwi. Its name is Smoothie, I hope. I hope that, bir that bird's name is Smoothie. I have decided its name is Smoothie. It's a strawberry kiwi smoothie. It's a beautiful night and the air smells so fresh, so I decide to take the long way home. I casually stroll through the neighborhood, taking in the sights and sounds of a suburban city with a low crime rate and wide walkable sidewalks at night. 
As I approach the bar, I can hear patrons inside cheering. Oh, I bet the game is on. I wonder if my team is playing tonight. A drop of water hits my head, and now with lots of drops of water, it's pouring rain. Maybe I should wait it out inside. I ordered a beer from the bar and settle in. Turns out that my team isn't playing tonight, but I can certainly enjoy the game regardless. The bar is unusually crowded, and the feeling of camaraderie over a shared love for the game makes me smile. Sports are nice. That is true. Like, I love- I don't care about sports. I like watching stuff like soccer and hockey, but I don't follow any teams, but I love the energy inside sports bars. I'll go to sports bars and watch the sports just to enjoy everyone else having a good time. Mm. Oh, this sounds really cute. I look over into the corner and spot none other than Mary sitting alone in the corner nursing a cocktail. This lady scares me. Like, she- Please, get a divorce. Let Joseph be free. Free yourself. Come on. Boop. A kiwi with strawberry for our shoulder mountain cannons. You know what? Why not? That sounds fucking awesome. Some sort of desert-based cannon sniper kiwi with strawberry fur. That's really cute. It was very cute. I like it. Hey, Mary. Something about her seems different this time. Now that she's by herself and not hanging off some younger guy, she looks so sad. She looks up and half-heartedly raises her glass to me before staring off into middle distance. You know what? Let's say hi to Mary. She creeps me out. Let's go say hi to Mary. I decide to go say hello. I walk over to her booth. She doesn't look up. Yeah, porcadillo. Or porcadillo. I can't remember what pronunciation you decided on, but... <laughs> yeah. I gotta sign off after this, but let you know. Or who knows? I may continue. I love this game. I decided to go say hello. I walk over to her booth. She doesn't look up. The seat taken? She still doesn't look up. I take a seat anyways, and she finally notices hey. me. Hey, cowboy. Y'all right? Never better. She hiccups. Guess she's a little far mm -hmm. gone. Tears start welling up in her eyes. Oh. Uh. I. Will you? walk a gal home. Let's walk her home. I slide out of the booth. Seems like Mary's having some trouble getting up. I reach out a hand to help her, but she waves me away. Mm. I got it, I got it. She clearly does not got it. You know what? Hang out here for a second. I walk over to the bartender and pay Mary's tab. Hey, I don't know if you remember me, but I live in Mary's cul-de-sac, and I'm just making sure that she gets home safe tonight. I know you. Yeah, it's nothing weird, just she usually has one of the bar staff walk her home, but I trust you. She doesn't, like, go home with... I don't really want to say it. One of the guys she meets. Nah. Nah? Ain't her thing. I say so she's not a cheater. Huh. I head back to the booth. Mary stumbles out of the seat and directly into my arms. It's still raining a little bit. I take off my coat and hold it over Mary's head. Such a gentleman. Let's get you home. Mary and I walk in silence up the street toward the cul-de-sac. I have no idea what to say to her for fear that she might hit on me. Or not? What did the bartender mean by ain't her thing? Sorry you have to see me like this. I'm usually not. I know Joseph doesn't like it when I just... Sorry. It's alright. Sorry if I'm ever mean to you. It's alright. No, it's not. I know it's not. I'm just... I'm having a really... Forget it. As we get to the cul-de-sac, I can feel Mary starting to slow down. By the time we arrive at the doorstep, she pulls away from me. Wait, can we just... Hold on. What's wrong? Hmm. Oh. How about another drink? Old time's sake. Uh, come on, Mary, it's bedtime. Mary looks me up and down, giving me a half-smile. Hey. You're right. She pulls me in close for a hug, holding onto me for a little longer than feels appropriate. She mumbles into oh. my chest. You're a good kid. Thanks for the company. Mary gives me a pat on the back, straightens out her sweater, and walks the rest of the way to the front door herself. Huh. Yeah, huh. Welcome. You've got best. Like, deeply concerned about Mary. And Joseph. I think they should get a divorce for their own good. I mean, like... Okay, well, let me take a sip of my iced tea. Ugh. <coughs> oh no, I'm running out of shape. Okay, I said I was gonna sign off, but I'm really tired and I don't want to do anything else. Let's go on another one. Robert's next. Let's see this weirdo again.
Maybe he'll cook something, and I'll get more cravings for more food. It's never too early to invest in a personal IRA. I really enjoyed the night I spent with Robert, but he's been dodging me ever since. I really want to see him again. I tried messaging him a few times, and Dad Book says he hasn't read them. He hasn't even come out of his house, actually. Is he okay? I decide to send him one last message, figuring that this will produce the same result. Hey man, don't know where you've been, but we should grab a drink soon. I walk away from my computer, because at this point, I know he's not messaging me back anytime soon. I linger in the kitchen. I'm all caught up on work, the house is relatively clean. Maybe I should do something nice for Amanda. Oh, I'll bake her favorite pie. Oh, now I want a pie. I root through the pantry and pull out all the ingredients. This is an old family recipe that I used to make with my grandmother back when I was a kid. I lost the actual recipe card a long time ago, but I think I'll be able to remember how to bake it. Didn't you say you don't know how to bake before when we were helping out, uh, when we were helping out Joseph? I start mixing the ingredients together for the crust until I get a nice dough. I throw in some cherries into a saucepan to make the filling. Normally, I don't like to multitask in the kitchen, but this cherry pie is a piece of cake. Pie? It's a piece of pie. I'm making a pie. Ah, <laughs> uh, man, I can never remember what temperature you're supposed to set the oven at. I'm pretty sure it's 375, but I could be wrong. Who am I kidding? I'm never wrong when it comes to this pie. My special twist on my grandma's recipe includes a secret ingredient that not even Amanda knows about. It really makes the cherries extra flavorful. God, why can't I remember what the secret ingredient is? More cherries, salt, almond extract. More cherries. <laughs> oh, it's more cherries, duh. Being the most important ingredient, to, important part of a cherry pie, I truly believe that you can never have enough cherries. Let's turn the cherry dial to 11. Oops, I accidentally poured a little too much in. Way too much in. I'm sure it's fine. Baking is an art, and some of the most beautiful art is made from mistakes. I finally get the pie in the oven. How long am I supposed to leave it in there? 50 minutes? I'll just wing it. Amanda's gonna be so excited. That kid loves a good pie. I have a seat at the kitchen table and do word jumbles until Amanda comes home. I can hear the door slam open. Yo, Pops, what smells like pie in here? Yeah, sometimes it can help to remind yourself what you're baking, just so you don't, uh... I guess forget what you're baking? It's pie, sweetie. I made you a pie. What flavor is it? Pie flavored? Just just in case anyone need to hear that joke again. In the year of our lord 2021. Amanda darks over to the oven and looks inside. Yes! Hey, it's not done. Be patient. What's your angle here? What? Pies are an, object are an objective based confection. What are you trying to get out of me? Fine, you caught me. Nothing! Leading a double life. Nothing! Can't dad bake his daughter a pie for no reason other than to make her happy? I don't trust you. I wait a few more minutes before taking the pie out of the oven. I set it on a rack to cool and guard it so Amanda doesn't take into it before it's ready. I have to do that with my dad. Huh. What? Does it look kind of, like, weird to you? Oh, that's just... Me taking artistic license on what cherry pie means to me emotionally. I'm just saying this because, you know, it seems like you might have baked this pie incorrectly. And you're currently, right now, trying to pass it off as a good thing. It's art, sweetie. Was it art when you accidentally baked a whole uncracked egg into the center of my <laughs> birthday cake? Oh, it's, how do you even do that? Was it art when you tried to make brownies and accidentally created chlorine gas? Well, that's just a bit of an exaggeration. Was it art when you... <laughs> it was performance art, okay? Just eat the pie, panda. I cut us a few slices and we sit down to eat. The cherry filling oozes out of the sides and the buttery crust glistens. I watch Amanda as Amanda uh -huh. takes a bite. Uh, what's wrong? Is it not good? Mm -hmm. Amanda winces and fans her mouth. Oh no, I just burned the heck out of the roof of my mouth. This pie is amazing. <laughs> Sorry for doubting you. I breathe a sigh of relief and take a, pie take a bite. She's right, the pie is pretty as incredible as it always is. I'm really proud of you for baking a pie without burning the new house down. I got a few dad tricks up my dad's sleeve. Maybe fathers aren't as bumbling and stupid as the media makes us out to be. Maybe we as a society should have a little more respect for fathers as a whole. Dad, your sleeve is on fire. I run to the sink and put myself out. Pride will be my undoing. Amanda and I clean up the kitchen and play a little more living room hoops before she retreats to her room to do homework. I go back to my word jumbles. Hey, this one spells cat. The rest of the evening trickles by. We eat dinner, I help Amanda with one of her scholarship applications, and we both start getting ready for bed. I decide to check dad book one last time before I climb into bed. Still nothing from Robert. Huh, I hope he's okay. I turn out the lights and lie down. Is he gonna fucking crawl through my window or something? Hey. Brogan. Hey. 
Hey, Brogan, come hang out with me. Oh, what is that? I was just on the verge of falling asleep. I hang, I climb out of bed and try to identify the source of the dinging. My computer screen illuminates the dark room. D do you just leave your computer on all the time? I guess that is a pretty dad thing to do. Mine, mine leaves his on all the time. Because he's too lazy to turn it off every day. I walk over to it, ready to turn it off, and I notice what's happening on screen. It's my winky face? Well, that's not exactly subtle. But, I mean, I did have fun with him the other night. I want to go make sure he's okay. You gonna kick me out this time? Maybe. Hurry up. God damn it. I reluctantly throw on a jacket and head outside. What's a little casual adult fun times between dads? I mean, that's probably what adults do, right? When it, well, you know, allosexual adults. When I get to Robert's place, the door is already unlocked. As much as I feel like hooking up with Robert, Robert again, this is maybe not the best idea. That's a problem for tomorrow, Brogan. Hey. Hey. So, how are things? Oh, yeah, there's that part in the beginning where you go to a bar because uh, Amanda wants to have a, a sleepover with her friends. And I was like, yeah, sure, fuck it, why not? So how are things? Robert stares at me. I know you're not here for small talk. I shrug. Uh, yeah, you got me. Robert closes the gap between us and whispers a series of increasingly filthy things in my ear as he backs me into his room. I'm starting to think maybe this was a good idea after all. Man, this guy is... Right down to business, huh? No subtlety. Very fast. But hey, that's just how some people are. Robert nudges me awake. Oh, hey. Are you kicking me out? Kicking out is a strong word. It's more like a gentle, friendly push. Gentle and friendly are not words I would ever use to describe Robert. I sit up and stretch. Oh, God, I'm so sore, and I haven't had hickeys like this since college. Jeez. Jesus Christ. I'm not doing this again if you're just going to force me to leave. Yeah, yeah. I'll say that next time, too. I throw my clothes back on while Robert smokes a cigarette on his balcony. See you around, I guess. Yep. He's such a mess. Oh my god. I walk back home, my bones creaking. Oh, what's his problem? Right? Don't eat too close to your bedtime. Date complete. <laughs> Bowling, family fun, paranoia, whiskey, blood, Dover ghost. C. What? Welcome. You've got dads. Knife dead. <laughs> I don't know those characters, but also I've never played the Metal Gears. Okay, I now have cravings for like 10 different kinds of food, so I gotta go... I gotta go make some kind of food. I guess I could uh, raid you all onto somewhere else, although you probably have other people to to lurk on. I don't know. Let's see if there's anyone else. Let me make sure this is saved. I haven't saved in like forever. Well, it, it auto saved, so it doesn't really matter, but. Okay, second with these three tomorrow, and then I'm gonna go for a third round with all of them and keep answering the message. They're so, they're all so sweet and fun. Oh, yeah, he's probably on, huh? You wanna go rage, eh, mister? In case you wanna work on drawing or something, or just see what he's getting up to. I'm opening, I'm opening my stuff. I want to make brownies, and I want to make cookies, and I want to go get a nice coffee. I want to make some pasta. Hmm. Yeah, okay. My stream manager is still slowly loading up, but yeah, we can go raid G Mr. G Mr. 
Okay, so this is saved. Let the title music play while stream manager very slowly loads up. Yeah, we'll give them some support. Boop, 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 boop. Oh, Firefox is just chugging along today. You can do it. You can do it. Come on. I love this title music. <laughs> this whole game is so well designed. All the characters are fun. The art is fantastic. It's getting there. I promise. Oh yeah. Why can't I raid anyone? Come on. Did I accidentally... There we go. Somehow I accidentally hit the edit manager thing. I don't know how to twitch. Okay, here y'all go. Oh, he's doing sketchbook sketches. Nice. Yeah, sorry, it took me a minute. Okay, 